Uh, welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of November 7, 2013. I'm City Council President Bill Dwight and I'm presiding. We start each meeting with um, uh, an opportunity for the public to speak. Um, and here are the rules of engagement. Um, you're allowed three minutes. Uh, there's a little timer that will make you freak out as, it, as the seconds count down. You're invited to wrap up within a sentence as the time expires. We aren't going to shut you off spot on at, the, at, at 3 o'clock if you're finishing your thought. But if your thought rambles on to two or three more pages, we'll ask you to stop. That's the royal we. I will ask you to stop uh, as, as the presiding officer. The other rules are that the council's not allowed to engage with the public. We've listened. This is the opportunity for the public to speak to the council, and the council has to shut up. And um, trust me, it's for the best, ultimately. But that, those are the rules. So if you do ask a question, it will remain unanswered, not out of respect, out of an absence of respect, but out of the conforming to the, uh, the rules of decorum. So uh, all that said, um, we have five people signed up. And that, the fact that you haven't signed up doesn't exclude you from speaking if you're, if you're so moved afterwards, and we'll have, give you an opportunity for that. First up is Marisa Hibbel. Hi there. I thought I had five minutes, so I'm going to make this quick. I'm Marisa Hebel. I'm the coordinator of the Northampton Prevention Coalition. I'm a Northampton resident. I'm the parent of two teenagers. I'm here to make comments about the or marijuana as medicine ordinance in front of you. Um, this ordinance reduces some of the measures as put forth by the Massachusetts State Department of Public Health. Um, it reduces some of the measures uh, that limit access to kids and some of the measures that make it um, so that the community sends a message that marijuana and kids don't mix. And I'm here tonight to urge you not to pass an ordinance that reduces any of the measures put forth by MassDPH. Um, MassDPH went through a thorough and lengthy process to develop these regulations. Reducing these regulations is uh, through the planning board is kind of like getting a prescription from your physician, running it by your banker, and having your banker um, recommend reducing the recommendations put forth by your physician. You, your physician has a body of knowledge and information that your banker does not have. It was mentioned during Monday night's ordinance committee meeting that there is no data to show that a lack of buffer zones around pharmacies increases youth use of pharmaceuticals. And I hear that point. Except marijuana dispensaries and pharmacies are not the same thing. I know that you have been told the contrary many times, but they are not the same thing. Uh, marijuana dispensaries are unique to anything that we've seen in this community, and they should be treated differently. Um, the fact that this ordinance leads with wording that states that a uh, dispensary is allowed in any facility where a pharmacy is allowed is utterly <coughs> misleading. So we've got a Venn diagram in front of us. We've got two circles that overlap in the center. One circle is dispensaries, one circle is pharmacies. Where they overlap is where they're similar because there are similarities. Someone goes to a physician, gets a recommendation, goes to a location, purchases that recommendation. But there are many, many ways that pharmacies and dispensaries are different. Imagine for a moment that a pharmacy is attempting, a new pharmacy is attempting to open up in Northampton. A pharmacy that is going to sell one medication, a cash-only pharmacy that is going to sell one medication, a medication that is not FDA approved, <coughs> that is going to be dispensed by someone who is not a licensed pharmacist, a medication that is mood-altering, that is has addictive properties, and uh, that ha whose potency has increased dramatically in the last 20 years, a medication <coughs> that is the second most commonly used substance amongst Northampton youth. I would hope that we would implement unique restrictions and regulations for a pharmacy like that because that is unique to anything that this community has ever seen. Uh, in addition, a dispensary is not the same thing as a needle exchange. They both provide very important services, but they are not the same. They should be treated differently. We can still be on the forefront of progressive health in this community and implement marijuana as medicine with all of the regulations as put forth by MassDPH. In California in 2010, the legislature um, passed Assembly Bill 2650, which added a 600-foot buffer zone between dispensaries and schools. This is a, <coughs> this is a state that has had marijuana as medicine for a long time and has been able to learn lots of lessons from their communities. Um, Berkeley, California has a 1,000-foot buffer zone from schools. San Francisco has a buffer zone of 1,000 feet from schools, recreation centers, or other buildings that house youth services. If anything, we should be learning from these states. My final thought. 
I understand you've all taken time to consider this issue, and that's, that makes a lot of sense. 130 communities across the Commonwealth have issued moratoriums to give themselves time to think about this. It's important that we make a good decision as opposed to a quick decision. Northampton youth deserve a good decision. A resolution would be great, um, but legislation is the most effective and important way to affect the, the, the health of a community. So on, on that, I, I urge you not to pass an ordinance that reduces the restrictions as put out by Mass DPH, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Arnon Vered, please. Hi. I'm uh, Arnon Vered. <coughs> I'm the co-founder of New England Treatment Access, and I live in Swampscott up in the North Shore, and we're going to be applying for an RMD application. I just want to make a few uh, quick points. So first of all, 81% of uh, people in Northampton voted for medical marijuana, and that's before they actually knew about some of the security measures. So physically in the store, in order to get in, you actually need two IDs. The idea that you have like a driver's license, but you need a special state ID just to enter the place where you can actually get uh, um, the medicine. You can't enter until, unless you are a patient, a caregiver, or you're in a unique situation. For example, you can't push your own wheelchair. So it's not like anybody else can actually come in. Of course, there's going to be physical security, like a security guard, security door, cameras, and there's going to be a statewide tracking system that will make sure that you can go to one store with your prescription or, or recommendation, get, then go to, to another one. and then. To add to, to security, there's a special a state felony that was created for this. If somebody actually diverts a, a medical marijuana to somebody else, it's a minimum of five years in, in prison. Compare that to what happens if you're actually caught with some marijuana today, uh, it's, a, it's a misdemeanor or, or a civil offense at the, at the max. Those are the real security measures. Uh, when it comes to, to buffer zones, I just want to reiterate what happened in some of the other uh, committees that were in this room. Uh, several people have mentioned it's not really hard to, to walk a few hundred feet. Um, that's, that's not really the issue. The way, the, the place that all these buffer zones came is old federal directives. Um, th that became a lot less important. That was, this is why so many cities are removing or, or really dim diminishing those buffer zones, which was the call memo that came from the US AG's office a couple of months ago. And what he said very clearly was very simple, is that if they were gonna have good regulation at the state level, and dispensaries are gonna follow it, the feds are gonna have hands off regardless of the size of the, of the operation. California is not in a good example of a place that has good regulation from a state perspective. It's probably that in, in Montana, some of the, uh, and there was it's completely dissimilar to Massachusetts. When it comes to pl things that, that are in the state regulation, like daycare and uh, a children, ch where children congregate, putting that on the map, we've certainly seen it here and in the other location, which is in, in, in Brooklyn, you start putting that on the map and you start running out of uh, real estate very quickly, you start putting those circles on the map. And a few people, again, in this room, the committees talk about uh, daycares, about how they're really not concerned that four years are going to escape daycare, go through all the security, go inside a dispensary and begin consuming uh, medical marijuana. Um, when it comes to this specific resolution, we actually ask you that, that you that you accept it. Some people actually thought about uh, removing even the 200 feet because of some of these arguments. We actually urge you to keep the 200 feet uh, a buffer zone because what it says to the state, and there's a legal issue here, uh, that we have looked at the buffer zone, and this is the buffer zone that we chose for this community. Um, so I urge you to, to actually keep it 200 feet. Um, other than that, if we are able to vote for it uh, uh, twice a day, so, we, so it's over for all the applicants so we can actually apply with certainty, that will be great. 10 seconds to go. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Ed Etheridge, please. <coughs> Edward Etheridge, 64 Gothic Street. Um, I uh, actually support what Arnon just said. The planning board um, put in a 200-foot uh, buffer. The city council thought that with all of the security measures, the ordinance committee, with all the security measures, no buffer was uh, particularly necessary um, because it's not the buffer that does any protection um, for these particular centers. They're limited in advertising and everything else. but doing land use regulation and other sort of regulatory matters, I would just say that having the 200 buffer, buffer is an easier thing to deal with than having no buffer, um, because then you have a specific regulation um, that's cited. Someone who's looking, um, the idea of regulation, whether it's for zoning or anything else, is before you do anything, you look at the regulation to see what's permitted so that you comply with it. Um, and if there's a question after the fact, that's okay, but if there's a question before the fact, that's problematic. So I support what Arnon said. Um, as, as he said, 82% of the people in Northampton voted for this. The security is good. But in terms of the regulatory enforcement issues, we would prefer to see the 200 buffer, foot buffer that the planning board recommended rather than not having a buffer, which is what the ordinance committee recommended. Either is acceptable, but that is just what we would prefer to see. Thank you. Thank you. Lori Geronimo, please. 
Hi, I'm Lori Geronimo, and I'm the COO of Hampshire Health. Now, last November, as you know, the voters of Massachusetts said it's time to provide patients who suffer from chronic and debilitating illnesses safe access to marijuana for medical purposes. Our mission is to implement the will of the voters in the most responsible and professional way possible. Our nonprofit organization, Hampshire Health, seeks to create a safe and secure environment where severely ill patients can access educational resources and the highest quality of organic medical marijuana available. Our board, our diverse board of directors, consists of local residents who have a vested interest in strengthening the network of quality palliative care services in Northampton, whose children attend school in Northampton and are experienced local stakeholders who want this newly legislated medical industry to be implemented well with community input, with your community input. Hampshire Health has applied solely for an RMD license in Hampshire County and is committed to locating in Northampton at 118 Cont Street, a building formerly occupied by the Pioneer Valley Family Medicine. <coughs> it's an ideal location since it was previously the home of a very busy medical practice. Hampshire Health was created solely to provide medical marijuana to qualified patients and we plan to do it in a professional, secure, dignified, responsible way. Our building location reflects our sensitivity to traffic mitigation and parking concerns of the municipality, as well as focus on patient accessibility. Hampshire Health has chosen a strategic partnership with the same highly qualified experts who built the most professional and secure medical marijuana facility on the East Coast, the Thomas E. Slater Compassion Center in Providence, Rhode Island. We extend to you an open invitation to visit the Slater Center anytime to show you why this facility has become so highly praised by Rhode Island patients, health officials, and, uh, and uh, local community leaders. With the team from the Thomas E. Slater Set Compassion Center, Hampshire Health will bring that same level of experience, knowledge, and professionalism to our community. Unlike many of the dispensaries in Western United States, the Slater Center's team has experience operating a medical marijuana facility in New England under strict, stringent re regulations similar to the regulations enacted in Massachusetts. Working collaboratively with the Department of Public Health, lawmakers, and law enforcement officials, Hampshire Health will ensure the highest level of security and safety. Throughout through the combined experience of our organizations, we also understand the need to provide a location that is accessible to patients from various types of transportation. Running a tight ship, not cutting any corners, and providing the highest quality services, we take our responsibilities very seriously. All medicine that will be provided at our facility will be thoroughly lab tested, our facility security will be second to none, and our commitment to being a responsible and contributing member of the, commu of the local community is paramount. By creating jobs, providing safe access to medical marijuana for registered <coughs> patients, and partnering with the local community, we are confident that Hampshire Health will be an asset to this city of Northampton. Northampton patients and residents deserve the best, and our team's track record proves that we can provide that. Hampshire Health also, we want to congratulate the City Council of Northampton for its leadership in drafting zoning regulations and paving the way for a retail marijuana dispensary to locate here in Northampton. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Lori. Uh, Ray Jackson, please. Hi, my name is Ray Jackson. I live at 23 Bottoms Road, and I'm here on the private way issue. Uh, we've lived there for like 25, 30 years now, uh, and our property abuts Bottoms Road. As long as, as long as we've lived there, the city has always plowed and maintained this road. This dirt road, not a driveway as the BPW claims, dates back in the 30s by the name of Walter Bottom. And as of 1957, when Mr. Leonard Day purchased the property from Ernest A. Demon, it was always plowed and maintained up until this year. So far, um, so, so, so far, well over 56 years, this road was taken care of by the city. Back in 1984, there were some issues raised about the the right of way of use of the road, and the DPW took steps back to uh, back off, and but they continued plowing. The issue of private ways sparked on the Cape was spread across the state because those communities and neighbors turned on each other with envy. This is not just a driveway. We have multiple dwellings here. 
Bottom Road is a dirt road, and over the years, it has stayed a dirt road. Just as the dirt roads in the meadows, the city owns and maintains these dirt roads. And the, uh, the reason for that is there's an airport there. Uh, they have access to the river for emergency rescue in the summer. As a taxpayer, we have those same services, but if the roads are washed out and we get snowed in, we have no access to emergency service. So as an abutter to Bottoms Road, we are asking that the city consider our petition request to have Bottoms Road become a public way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's all we have signed up. Is there anyone else that wish to speak? Going once, going twice. Thank you very much for your time there. Um, I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll, please. Councilor Adams? Here. Present? Here. <laughs> yes. Here. Yes. Here. 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 Thank you, Mary. Um, we had a 705 uh, public hearing scheduled for Sandry Realty Incorporated doing business as Sunoco uh, at 776 North King Street in Northampton. It's the application for a license amendment for storage fuel. Um, and I'm calling that hearing to order. Is there, are there any proponents here, please? Are you a proponent? Is the applicant here? Okay. Come on up. You're the proponent. I'm sorry. Yeah, we, it's fancy language for, <laughs> if you're, if, okay, that's all right. Could you tell me your name, please? My name is Sharon Abbott. I work for the Sandry Companies out of Greenfield, Mass. We own the Sunoco Station, 776 North King Street. And um, we're proposing to um, reduce, we currently have 30,000 gallons of flammable storage underground at the gas station now. And we're proposing to reduce the flammable storage down to 21,000 gallons and add 9,000 gallons um, of diesel fuel. Um, our industry as a whole is starting to see an increase in people buying passenger cars and light duty truck vehicles for diesel. So the need is there um, at the gas station level. Um, so that's what we're looking to do. And in order to do that, we need to amend our license as it currently stands. Um, any questions of the applicant? Councilor Tacey. You're going to reduce it? By 10,000 gallons. Well, we're going to reduce our, our current storage of flammables. We have three 8,000-gallon tanks. Yep. So we're going to reduce that down to 21,000 gallons. We're changing the tanks out. That's why we're doing it. We're taking the opportunity, if we can, to do it at this time. So we're going to change the tanks out. Right now, we have three 8,000-gallon underground storage tanks that all hold gasoline. So that's 24,000 gallons. We want to put in two 15,000-gallon tanks. One is going to hold just gasoline. The other will be what they call a split compartment tank. Part of that will be um, our another blend of gasoline at um, 6,000 gallons. And then we would have 9,000 gallons of diesel fuel in that tank. So that's what we'd like to do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Councilor Labarge. Thank you. Um, are you seeing an increase on the diesel? In well, other people are in the industry. We don't we don't offer diesel at, at, at too many of our gas stations in this area, and the ones we are, we are seeing more vehicles and more people asking, you know, why aren't you offering diesel? And the industry as a whole is seeing an increase in passenger car diesel requests. So that's why we thought we'd take this opportunity while we're <coughs> upgrading the station. Are there different storage criteria depending on the fuel? Does diesel have a higher or lower threshold of, of safety measures, or are they comparable? Um, it, it is, a, it is a co compared to the gasoline, which is more flammable than, than the diesel fuel, which is a combustible. Um, underground, there's not a lot of difference. Above ground, you have to do different measures. But underground, it's pretty much the same uh, technology for the tanks, yes. If that's and is that going to require you to change any other of your facilities once? Uh, I'm sorry? Was that going to require you to change any other facilities that you're going to have on the property besides just the tank no, replacement? No, just the tanks and the piping. And we're going to put new dispensers in, which will offer the diesel as well as gasoline at the dispensers. Councilor Tacey. I'd always wondered why you hadn't provided diesel fuel at that station right off the highway. 
Kind of. Well, that's what it, we're, that's what we're going forward in the future, trying any of our interstate locations, we would like to be able to offer diesel. We're not trying to attract the big tractor trailers. We're not big enough for that in the yard, but basically for the passenger cars traveling through. And Neither is the pride station on the corner, and that's quite a debacle there is sometimes, uh, yeah, yeah. For, for traffic. Yeah. It's in the wrong spot, so I thought maybe that might relieve some of that congestion also. Um, okay, thank you. Any other questions for the applicant? Thank you very much. Um, are there any opponents or anyone speaking to any other aspect of this hearing? I'll accept a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. All those in favor of closing the hearing, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Um, discussion on, on the application? Consultation? I think it's a great idea. Anything that would relieve a little bit of that pressure at the Pride Station on the corner of King Street and Damon Road would be welcome. Um, Council Murphy? I would move to grant the permit as requested. Second. Second. <clears throat> Second. Any discussion on the on approving the, the application and the permit and authorizing permit? Um, and we can do this voice vote or is this roll call? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniel? Aye. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Pace? Yes. Thank you. Uh, permits granted. Thank you. Uh, we also now uh, take this time. This is also a scheduled hearing for the tax classification for FY 2014. Is there's Joan. Joan, come on up. <laughs> um, thank you for coming, Joan. Joan is from the is the assessor, and uh, here to present and. A recommendation for the tax classification. What's that? <coughs> Joan, you have the floor. The floor is yours. Okay. So I'm passing out this sheet because I think it's very interesting that the uh, Department of Revenue has this sheet set up in Gateway and it's telling how much money we can raise each year. So when you look at the middle of the sheet where it says 2014 levy limit, so we start with 43,768,074. 78. In the middle of the page about? Mm, two. Four. Eight. 43. No, 23. Is it my eyes? Or? That's the FY 213. You're looking at number two. Item E and yeah. A. A or number two, two E. Two in A. the 14 levy limit. Calculate the yes. FY 14 levy okay. limit. Okay. So that's what we start with. Oh, and then they add the new growth, which is a million ninety four two oh two. Actually, that's the two and a half. Then the new growth, which are very fortunate to get <clears throat> almost 50 million in new value for new construction for the city, which um, allowed us 716,719 for new growth. Um, and the override is 2,500,000. And um, I just wanted to show that that was 78 cents on the tax rate. So then they give us the new total and below we start with that and then we have to add the uh, debt exclusions for the different um, JFK, the high school, the fire station. And um, the police had a $700 amount there to be raised and so that was 22 cents. I just thought <coughs> that you would be interested in this. Um, 
We do have a levy limit, levy ceiling, which you can see in F. That's um, 80 million, um, but we're we're way under, so we don't need to worry about that. But some communities have hit their levy ceiling, and in that case, they can't even use their new growth. So it's sort of a sad situation. So we're here tonight to talk about the tax rate for FY14. The tax rate will be $15.40, an increase of $1.14 per thousand. Um, Susan and I have been working to try to get everything put together so we can get a tax rate set hopefully this month. Um, you can vote to increase the tax to the commercial taxpayers and de decrease the residential taxpayers rate. Usually communities do not follow this procedure if they have a 20% base for commercial. That's really very low. Um, we can shift 13% from the residential to the commercial side. But we have to stop and think for the commercial people we've already added the CPA which they pay with no exemption we've added the bid in a lot of cases if they're in that area plus they will be receiving the stormwater charges that it will be coming up to their commercial tax bill as it is also um, we're kind of concerned about the TIFs that we've passed for some commercials because if a higher tax rate would just wipe the TIF out. For every dollar we take off the residential rate, it adds four to the commercial rate because our percentage is 20% we have for commercial <coughs> of our total value and 80% are the residential people pay. <clears throat> I, was, I was hoping that uh, we were gonna gain some more in commercial this year and see that go up maybe to 24 but um, because we had 22 new houses and they're kind of expensive houses come on the books we had that uh, for new growth also so um, we pushed the residential percentage up too but we have many um, well not many but we have quite a few commercials that are partially finished that will pick up next year as being finished and that will give us the additional new growth there. Um, communities that did pass this increase for their community right away and in most cases it was where they had a lot of old mills and a power plant and they wanted them to pay more than their share. Um, now many of the communities are trying to switch it, ba switch it back slowly it's very difficult to do. <coughs> our, our values for the commercial are already high. They will not hold with a higher tax rate. I'm concerned about that. I would urge you to stay with a factor of one for all properties. And I talked about um, the new growth, 50 million. That was really great. Um, and the new homes were basically up on Village Hill. And also, this is another thing that you can do to the tax rate. You can allow 20% um, of the average assessed value of a home, which is around 300000 So for every home that, that, has, that you domicile in, it's a little catchy, you have to be sure they're living in the home to give this exemption. Um, you take value off their tax bill, but, but then in return, you have to increase the tax rate to make up for what you've given to um, the lower. The lower price houses still get the higher tax rate, but they'll benefit more from add, um, subtracting the 20%. So the lower valued homes would benefit, but at the expense of the higher valued homes. Um, and one thing that really bothers me about this exemption is that we have a lot of low-income um, 
available in Northampton, and that would push their tax rate up substantially, especially something like Meadowbrook. So um, th that's one thing, one other thing you can do with the tax rate. And the third thing is um, the state sends us a, a list of small businesses with less than 10 employees. For instance, the list has about 276 businesses le listed, and you can vote a 10% reduction to that business on this list. But the tax rate for um, remaining commercial industrials would, the remaining, this is, uh, would have to make up that difference, the people that aren't on this list. Uh, for instance, if the business is a strip mall, for instance, or even like Thorns, all those businesses would need to qualify for this exemption. If one doesn't, then nobody gets the exemption. And the benefit of the exemption would go to um, the person owning the property and I'm not sure that they would give a refund check to all their small businesses. Uh, there's only uh, several communities that use this, but it is available. In the end, there's really no free lunch. If you favor one class of property, you burden another class. The best thing is to encourage business to come into Northampton that will help the homeowner in a different way. Also, you have to remember that businesses don't have children that go to school. And our new economic development person is working hard to allure more businesses in to Northampton. Thank you, Joan. Uh, questions, please, uh, Councilor Tacey. The, the police station, the, the point, uh, the 22 cents, that was 717,000? Yes, so we raised this year 717,000 for the levy yeah all of our uh, like like the high school the JFK fire station it came to a million four one four six oh eight those are our debt exclusions that are eventually going to get paid off and I think a couple of them are close to that um, they're added together submitted on a sheet to the Department of Revenue and the um, police station is in that amount. It, is the police station in the 1.414? Yes. Okay, thank you. Councilor Adams. So if I'm reading page six correctly, um, under the residential exemption example, a person who owns a home valued at $200,000 would see a tax break Five hundred sixty-four thousand fifty-two cents, mm -hmm. and that would be subsidized by those with more expensive homes. Right. Now, if I'm also reading it correctly, going down the list, we can see how the various values um, would lead to various tax breaks, and then eventually increases once you start getting to the more expensive values, home values. So, am I reading it right that? If you owned a home valued at four hundred fifty thousand dollars, you would still be getting a seven dollar ninety eight cents tax. Right. I'm not sure. This is an estimate of how it would come out, because we have to find out how many of these houses and condos um, people domicile in. I mean, probably most of the one hundred ones people own, but there are a few that would be rented. But the condos, I really feel that. Um, many of those are rented, which we wouldn't allow an exemption, so we'd really have to look into that situation. Well, so before you would see an increase, you would have to own a home of worth a half a million dollars before you would see an Well, I think really um, it would start earlier if I was just I'm, trying I'm, to... I'm, I'm not really... Oh. Really exacts my, my point okay is much more general than that I'm not that's that's not oh okay what I mean is if somewhere in the vicinity of owning a half million dollar home that's where you begin to subsidize those who have a home value um, more inexpensive home value this may be something we should consider because then we'd essentially be subsidizing um, though I mean theoretically those who have a home worth a half million dollars or more <clears throat> can probably 
afford a $98.48 um, tax increase. If you own a home worth $700,000, um, that's a $540.48 tax increase over the course of a year, and that's not a substantial amount through, um, divided up over four quarters. However, if you own a home of $200,000 and your tax break is $564.52, that may make a difference. That may be helpful. Um, so I think that this is something that the Massachusetts General Laws allows for. It's clearly based on the social justice concept. And um, I think this is something we should consider. And also, we can have a factor of one and this exemption. So um, I think this is something we should consider. Councilor DeBarger is next, then Councilor Murphy, then Councilor Specter, Councilor uh, Freeman Daniels. So, Councilor LaBarge. Thank you. So, Joan, if we did not do this factor one mm -hmm. and decided to go the other way, what and why, which I'm hearing from you of stressing doing the factor one, why and what is the problem of having commercial come in, of breaking that tax break? You, what, I think I think if you give the homes a tax break at the expense of the commercial property, I don't think our values will hold. Our values are high for the commercial property. And um, I think in the formula, the tax rate is taken into consideration. So I really don't think our values would hold. Our values are high, you know. We have 25 dollars a square foot, thirty dollars a square foot on Main Street. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go down to Holyoke, Springfield, Chicopee, you don't see anything like that value. It's because of who we are. We're kind of the envy of everybody. Because I know I hear every year that it's not a good way to go. And you also stated last year that because of the economy going through the recession to not look at it. So would this also be a reason of why of not looking going the commercial? Right. Our stores are doing well, but not as well because of, of the economy and the situation. Last year you also talked about how many building permits versus what are we doing now with building permits? So do you know, can you give me a well, comparison? We were able to pay, pick up 50 million, and this is through building permits. The new construction was pretty amazing during this time, but we have a lot of building permits that amount to a lot more money than we've had in the past few years. Councilor Murphy. Mm -hmm. um, to, I just want to address both of those questions as well. The, the commercial properties are valued based on the income they generate. Taxes is a fixed expense that reduces their income. So if you take an income property that's valued at a million dollars and you jack its tax rate by $9.80 a thousand, you reduce the income it generates and therefore reduce its value. <clears throat> and it continues to do that. So it, when, you increase their in, when you increase their expenses, their value goes down, their tax yield goes down. And that's why a lot of communities that do this eventually figure it out and go, you know, we're bleeding the goose here because the values keep going down as the expenses of taxes go up. So in the first year or two, it's UPIO, but after about 10 years, the values of those buildings that settle down and your yield goes away, which is one of the reasons we tend not to do that here. The other problem, you know, if you talk about commercial social justice, is that somebody that owns a $5 million building on Main Street has a triple net lease and they're passing those taxes on to their tenants. So the guy selling posters and jelly beans is paying the tax, not the person that owns a building because the taxes follow through the lease to the tenant. So you end up decreasing the value of the building and its tax yield to the city and put the burden of that not on the building owner but on the tenant. So that's one of the reasons we don't do that. Um, and then the, the Unfortunately, the residential exemption has, has a real nasty social justice implication because on the surface it looks great. Oh, I own a $200,000 house, so somebody with a $700,000 house will be picking up the taxes that I don't pay. But every rental house in the city will also pick that up. So I own a $250,000 house that I live in, I get a tax break. 
My neighbor rents a $250,000 house. That owner doesn't get a tax break because they don't live in it, so their rent gets jacked to cover the tax increase. So on the surface, it's very tantalizing, but when you figure every rental property in the residential class is not going to get the exemption and all those tenants are going to get jacked rents to cover those new taxes, so, I mean, how is it social justice that somebody that owns a $250,000 house gets a break, but somebody that rents one right next door doesn't? In fact, they pick up the break that their neighbor got. I mean, many of these exemptions, all of them were not written for Northampton. They were written for Boston. They were written for resort places like Cape Cod. They, weren't they were not written for the city of Northampton, so they don't really fit here. And if you, if you try and jam them in, there's an unintended consequence that you know, you can split your tax rate if you have a new plan, because it isn't going anywhere and it can't escape. So heavy industry, big infrastructure things can't leave. But the small businesses, if you split your tax rate and you're giving a, you know, a two dollar break to a residential person and a thirteen, you know, a thirteen percent increase to the other side at almost ten bucks, um, because you're spreading a break to seven, almost eighty percent of your tax base over about 20% of your tax base. So a little break to 80% of the people is a major increase to the other 20. And, and the fact that it then decreases their values when you do that, so the yield keeps going down year after year uh, un until you really lose any advantage you had in the beginning. And it's very hard to get out of because once you give people a tax break, it's much easier to give one than take it away. And if you give 80% of the people a tax break and then decide it's the economically wrong thing to do, is really hard to take it away. Councilor Specter and then Councilor Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Councilor Murphy explained. I had the question of what do we mean that our, the values, the commercial values would not hold, and you explained what that meant, so I appreciate that. Yeah, I, although on the surface I agree, something to look at in terms of the um, $200,000 versus the $700,000 home. The problem is, in a, in a ward like mine, I know a lot of people struggle in that they're kind of property rich, but income poor. They've lived here for a long time, and the value of their home has gone up. They're on a fixed income. And so they may own a home, especially in a ward like mine, where the values have skyrocketed. And they're staying there, but they're really struggling to pay those taxes. They're living on Social Security and small retirement. So they're not all, it, it may be true for people moving in and having the the funds to pay for a home now at 700000 but a lot of these people would never have been able to afford to move into the neighborhood now. They just happen to have been here for a long, long time, and this is their nest egg, and this would really hurt them. So I think it gets very complex, um, and I think we'd have to do a lot more work at seeing, you know, kind of what really would the numbers be on this? How many people would it affect that I'm talking about in some wards? Maybe there are certain wards where it applies and it doesn't apply in, in others, but I know the values in Ward 2 have, have really gone up so high that it would, it would squeeze a lot of people there. So, Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor Karn. Uh, I support the factor of one, and um, I just want to call the Council's attention to the fact that the residential exemption example given on page 6 is the maximum. So a smaller one could be uh, effectuated with a... Um, with some um, helpful benefits that uh, that does not create a major burden on uh, renters or the higher value properties. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councilor Carney, then Councilor Adams. Okay. Um, I also support the factor of one, <clears throat> and um, was concerned when I looked at the uh, consequences for renters <coughs> in terms of the shift. Um, uh, primarily because it's clear that 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 burden would be shifted to renters um, so many folks for example and there's a large number of condo units in Ward one or is river run and a number of places where that are um, you know certainly less than 250 worth less than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars but they're not owner occupied and they are rented I think probably half of those at, at river run and so I'd be and those are typically low-income people so I would be concerned about a shifting of that burden, especially since it was not a, I mean, it, um, it could be a significant shift in a burden to a renter for, you know, a $500 a year um, break on a $200,000 home. And that would set up, you know, that strange um, irony between one 
condo owner living right next door to another renter with a significant increase in cost or difference in cost. It wouldn't have to be that, as, as Councillor Freeman Daniel said. It could be a lesser amount if we didn't do the maximum. But I'm just concerned about the implications of that for renters and um, would be really uh, want to be very careful about that. Councillor Adams. And then Councillor Tacey. What mechanism would you have in place to police whether or not they were owners or renters? I think we'd probably have to hire somebody to check every project out, you know, like go to River Run and find out how many people, how many rentals there are there. Um, More than cumbersome. It would be. We'd need some help, yep. You would, you would absolutely need additional staff. Basically, this was, like David said, it was passed for the Cape communities because um, that's why you see that domicile clause in there. They wanted to give it to the summer people that had the expensive <coughs> cottages. This and, is why this. this and this passed. discussion is not something new. This is We have this every year, every single year, and it's always right. the same. And I thought maybe you had that wrote down because you said that last year. <laughs> so I the circumstance you doesn't change. You came here. Uh, <laughs> I think I've said this for the last. A lot longer than I have. Yeah, for, so my two cents worth is I'm going to support the factor of one with no residential exemption. Council Adams, please. Um, the reason why I think it's worth a discussion at minimum is because, um, well, I, I, Murph, Councilor Murphy brings up the point, and, and, and the issue is it's, it's, it's um, homeowner affordability, particularly those with low value homeowner, um, lower value homes on the spectrum. Um, versus commercial and rental affordability. So, um, but I think, as, as Councilor Spector said, it might be worth really looking at what that what that means if, if we if we take a look at what the numbers are exactly and what what that burden would be for some people. And as Councilor Freeman Daniels pointed out, um, this is the example is with 20 percent, but we can give from you know anywhere 20 or 20 or below. So. I think it's a worthwhile consideration, and again, we can also have a factor of one and this. So, um, we we talk about affordability, and we shouldn't ignore the fact that we have this mechanism, um, which actually could relieve the, the tax burden of some people in our city, um, some of those people who are struggling. So, I think it's worth worthy of further conversation. Thank Council, you, Councilor Murphy. Yeah, um, Joan mentioned this is really for the Cape. And where you see it work there is a town like Chatham. You know, Chatham has a, a real range of property. I mean, you've got multi-million dollar beachfront properties owned by out-of-town people as vacation homes. And then you've got the regular population of policemen, firefighters, teachers, restaurant workers, the year-round residents that live in the town. It works really well where there's that major shift between property values from luxury vacation homes and the homes of the typical person. While we have, you know, seven hundred thousand dollar homes, we don't have seven million dollar homes, and that's really what they wrote it for, was to take advantage of those very very expensive vacation homes and give a break to basically the year-round population who keeps the town running, so that the vacation people can come and afford it. In fact, there they pay personal property tax on the vacation people on everything in their house too, because it's not their principal residence. So they really get zinged down there. But you know, I agree with the, the philosophy. If you got a a $10 million beach house, you probably can afford the taxes on that. Um, they also don't quite have the rental impact. I mean, I think almost half our residents live in rental housing in the city, I think. And half of them do. So yeah. that, that is where it really creates a problem for me because you shift it over onto those landlords that pass it on. I mean, we're already passing on it over a dollar per thousand increase in the base tax. We're going to pass on a stormwater fee. And then if we do a residential shift like this and add more, it's going to really impact those rents. And I mean, that I think of the rental housing population as much more vulnerable. Uh, you know, if you own a home, you're doing better than most of the tenants are in the city you're in. You know, you got in and you've got a fixed expense for your housing. So that's really what concerns me is the impact on the people who live in rental housing um, of a dollar a thousand plus a stormwater fee. What's that do to their rent? And then we do a shift on them too. That only makes it harder and harder to, to control rents. And I feel bad for people in rural housing if we do this to them. Um, Joan, I have a question. <clears throat> Every time we set the tax rate, it essentially 
The tax rate is essentially the apportioned amount so that everyone pays that proportion that contributes to the, the revenues. And always when we set the tax rate there, because you, there's a center point, right, there are some people actually, in some cases, to depending on how their neighborhood's value may pay less than they paid in previous years. Is that is that true? Right. And then there will be other people who in neighborhoods that have uh, experienced more growth, more development, or more value on their property, they will actually realize an increase in their taxes. But it and it and there is a tipping point not not dissimilar to the way you've laid this out even with the with the uh, um, the 20 uh, 20% mitigation. There's still, there will still be people, if I understand this correctly, who will get a tax bill that may be lower than it was in previous years. That's right. And, and the struggle, of course, is always to try and explain why that is. Um, it all depends upon the sales in your neighborhood. Their value. Right. Um, it seems like some communities are seeing their values fall, but because Northampton is what it is, they aren't falling here. Um, but for some instance, neighbor in Hoyoke and Springfield, they're at their levy limit. So even if they get new growth, if they get a five new houses, they can't even use it. And because their values are falling, that means their two and a half is falling, and they can't even use that. So it's a real problem. Councilor Freeman Daniels is next. Then Council Tasty, Council Barge, Council Murphy. I, um, I don't. I think we're pr pretty much off the residential exemption. But I do want to point out that uh, earlier in the year, the council um, passed a uh, zoning package that significantly loosened the uh, restrictions on um, on new construction and also um, using lots and existing structures for for um, additional units. Um, and uh, we did it, the council did that in URB and C. Uh, I, I think it's it was past time to bring it to URA as well. Uh, and that's a this is a um, a way in which it was touted, and it is the case that peop that uh, property owners with larger parcels or with larger homes would be able to create uh, more units either inside the home or on a separate or subdivide their parcel or something like that. And uh, with that. They would. They may be able to stay in their home, uh, albeit a smaller one. Um, but uh, I don't think it's out of bounds for the council to consider uh, that uh, people with um, lower valued homes will, may not be able to do that. They might live in a ranch of a uh, of twelve hundred square feet that's that just cannot be divided. Uh, and so again, the residential exemption uh, may be seen as a um, appropriate counterpoint to the zoning package that w that the council put forward uh, put put through. And I hope the, count, the future council will put through for URA and, uh, and other areas of the city in the future. Um, Councilor Tacey, then Councilor LaBarge, and then Councilor Murphy. Yeah, I'd love to save the $343 on my house. I mean, because mine went up $389. So I'm still going to pay 40 bucks more, even if I got 20% off. Um, but um, I well, see. Will you get to be 70? Maybe you can come in and have an exemption. <laughs> I already made an exemption. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, I oh, think uh, I, I think we we beat. That up. If we're going to do that, I think it would probably be uh, uh, in our best interest to try and start to figure that out long before we come to your uh, night to pass. I think there should be hearings or something like that. that we um, this is a hearing. Well, just not I, I to mean, put too fine a point on it, but it's as uh, Council LaBarge. Right. That's right. So, Joan, I live on Florence Road, but across the street are homes that are worth a million. A million. In West Hampton Road? Florence Road. <coughs> okay. Directly across the street, you have some beautiful homes. But on Florence Road, like I just heard Councillor Tacey say, and also Councillor Owen Freeman Daniels, smaller homes that are probably worth about 197000 200000 whatever. So why would they be paying the same 
as this house that's worth a million or a million and a half. Well, the house that you're speaking of isn't like any other house in Northampton. Um, it's absolutely fabulous. Um, but we, we will, we, there won't, there hasn't been a sale there, but we do have a high value because of the magnificent house. I'm talking about houses. Well, there's, there's not, not just one. There's like three well, they're valued according, question, according, according to the sales in that neighborhood, yeah. and they're valued according to the square feet. The computer picks out the house that is most similar to the house that they're value, that's valuing according to the scare, square feet, the grade, the condition. Everything's in, taken into consideration, and each each year it changes because of the sales. So it's good. we have a lot of sales. Every sale went to the state, and we had to do a sales ratio study to so, show that we were still coming in within 5% of 100%. Uh, I've lost track. Either Council Murphy, you are next. Um, no, I mean, if, if, if the council would like in the next year for the Finance Committee, you know, because we, we don't ever talk about this except for when we're in this hearing, and then it goes away. Uh, I'm really confident that if we laid out the impact on everybody in the city for a residential exemption, you would find that it hurt more people than it helped. But we certainly can do the math for that in the before this comes around again in a year, so that we can have a yeah. you know look at the spreadsheet and say, oh, you're right. You know, between you know what it does in the, in to the the more expensive homes, what it does to the tenants, it really doesn't work for us. I think the most telling thing is that of 351 cities and towns in Massachusetts, 12 of them do this. And I bet every one of those has a la Atlantic Ocean frontage to it. Or Berkshire. Or, <laughs> or maybe maybe they're in the Berkshire. Maybe they're like Stockbridge or and something. And the residential like people living there, they're not happy and it, with And all it's those got a, a high portion of so expensive vacation homes. To give them the business. Yeah. So they've got <laughs> they've got a way to you've got to get away get way to get away with it that doesn't hurt the residents of the community. And I would feel really bad, you know, if you're a resident of the community in rental housing, you shouldn't get hurt by us giving somebody a break that's a resident of the community in a house that they own, you know, at at all. Um, well, I worry about the, a lot of the low income housing, Meadowbrook, Hamden Gardens. Because they're in the residential class, the so it shifts we to raise them. the taxes. And when you know when you've got 11 or 12 million on something it's really gonna raise them mm -hmm. yeah but I mean if, if you want to ask the Finance Committee in the new term to do the math on this so that we're comfortable the next time it comes around that it really you know it really doesn't work for the majority of the citizens we, we can certainly do that if you want us to so it's not a last-minute thing Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor LaBarge I was gonna move to close the hearing oh uh, Council of the I yield. Question? I yield. Councilor? Um, I would highly suggest that we could do that. I think that's a good direction, Councilor. Yeah, I know that, that, that's that's next, and it's we're not going to close the hearing until the public gets a chance and then opponent. Okay. okay. Um, and I, I just, and I only add, want to add to this, I would actually agree to that charge to the Finance Committee because um, I think this is salient points, and this is this has informed every debate that we've had in, in many of the past elections, including the most recent, and that um, there is the pressing concern that everyone recognizes and acknowledges, and anything that we can do that can successfully mitigate, I think, is an appropriate mm -hmm. is is appropriate to research and then possibly even vote on. Mm -hmm. um, now we've reached the point in our our hearing where the public, if the public has any questions or wants to step up and speak to this, uh, you're invited to do so. Suzanne. Even though I do this, every, my name is Suzanne Beck. I live at, um, I'm here representing the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce and I live on Park Hill Road. Um, and even though I do this every year, it certainly can't be overstated how important it is that you all support the factor of one policy. Um, it's not, and it, it is the consistency kind of as there, even as the council turns over its members, You've, de you've declared a very strong policy preference for factor of one. And of course, that gets factored into any investment decision that um, is made in the city. And it, it also sends a message that you recognize that that policy not only supports the business community's vitality, but that 
is a shared benefit with the residents of the of Northampton and other communities. So um, just an interesting note, a couple of weeks ago, Terry Masterson, who's a member of our Economic Development Committee, kind of ran through the list of, of development projects in the city of Northampton right now, and it totaled $81 million. It's probably unlikely that we've seen that kind of commercial development um, in, at one, in one snapshot in quite a lot of, uh, you know, quite a long time. And we know it's Village Hill, it's King Street, it's um, the reuse of the Clark School property that's all contributing. But the, the, the thing to keep in mind um, in terms of your decision about the factor of one is that it, you know, this is the foundation policy that kind of balances the regulatory and the market forces that are also contributing to what a property is worth and whether an investment is feasible. So it, it is probably the most cr critical from a commercial business development point of view, it is probably the most c critical decision you'll make all year. And it's, um, I just, you know, I need to say that every year that it's, that, you know, we, are, we applaud that consistency and we certainly agree with the policy. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would wish to speak at this time? Uh, Your Honor. I, I just <laughs> wanted to go on record on behalf of my administration that I am a, uh, we support the factor of one, continuing the factor of one. Um, echoing what Suzanne said, clearly we're experiencing a significant uptick in economic development in the city. And in some of the discussions we've had um, with businesses, you know, they're looking at different cities, different uh, tax rates, um, and, uh, and clearly the, the factor of one is, is one thing that we can point to in terms of being advantageous to locating here. And I also want to emphasize that the issue of um, when you go that other way, how difficult it is. And we can look around to many of our neighbors in the valley um, who have uh, gone away from the factor of one and are now uh, in a position including some who have reached their levy limit. Um, and so any new growth that happens in their community will not be, you know, be added to their tax base. Um, and it's very difficult, as, as the assessor said, to go back. In terms of the residential exemption, um, echo what Councillor Murphy said. And there's also several communities you can find online that have done very exhaustive studies of this. Sudbury has a 72-page report. They commissioned a study. Um, and went through it. And they, going into it, they thought there were social justice implications, thinking this will benefit elders in the community. Um, at the end of the report, they find that that's actually not the case. Um, and so many communities look at it. So I do, I do think it's important for us to look at it um, because it is, I think, deceptive the way it's presented, um, in the way it's sort of presented uh, in, the, in the legislation and the regulation. But in terms of the actual impact, I think we'd find that it would have a negative impact in Northampton. So I support just a straight factor of one. And then the only other thing, as Susan Wright has pointed out to me, is that if you were to do something like this, we'd need a lot of lead time in terms of setting the tax rate. Um, and, and, and so I'm thankful that you're not going to make this change tonight. Um, and that you will take some time uh, leading up to this hearing in the future if you do decide to move in that direction. Thank you. Is there anyone else in from the public with wish to speak on this? I'll accept a motion to close the hearing. So moved. Second. All those in favor of closing the hearing? Aye. Aye. Okay, uh, Council Murphy. I would move that we adopt a factor one for fiscal year 2014. Second. Second. Or 15. Um, it's 15. Does it come out of finance? I'm sorry? Doesn't it have to come out of finance? 14. The recommendation for? Yeah, I think so. 14. 14. Yeah. This is on uh, the uh, it, Yeah. It, that has to come out of finance, uh, Mr. President. The, the order's in finance, so that's a good yeah. point. Mm -hmm. So we can't vote yeah. it out of good catch. It's not, we can vote. Oh, the, vote to recommend to the full council, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. When we get the finance. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels, for that. Um, Okay. So what else do you need? To, is there any other packet of paper? Okay. All right. Uh, now is the point that, uh, well, we have communications from the mayor. Any communications from the mayor? Okay. This is upon the recommendation of Mayor J uh, David J. Narkowitz and City Council President William H. Dwight. This is a resolution. Whereas in November 2012, the voters of Massachusetts approved a statewide ballot measure eliminating criminal and civil penalties for the use of marijuana by qualifying patients who have been diagnosed with a debilitating medical condition, and whereas the voters of Northampton overwhelmingly supported the legislation, 
for medical marijuana by a margin of 81 percent. And whereas five applicants have been qualified under the Massachusetts Department of Health regulations to apply for a registered marijuana dispensary license as part of its competitive final phase two application process. And whereas several applicants have expressed an interest in opening a medical marijuana dispensary in the city of Northampton and have met with city officials and community stakeholders to discuss their plans. And whereas the city of Northampton has an established history and network of quality palliative care services and is an appropriate location for Hampshire County Medical Marijuana Dispensary. And whereas the siting of a medical marijuana facility in the city of Northampton will provide economic development benefits through temporary construction jobs, permanent facility jobs, and the uh, generation of new local revenue through property taxes or payments in lieu of taxes. Mm -hmm. And whereas the Northampton City Council, with input and recommendations from the Planning Board and the Board of Health, has implemented a responsible zoning regulations to ensure that any proposed medical marijuana facilities meet reasonable site plan criteria for issues like parking, traffic, hours of operation, lighting, security, and neighborhood character. And whereas the Massachusetts Department of Public Health's final phase two application for a registered marijuana dispensary license seeks a d demonstration of support or non-opposition furnished by the local municipality. And so, now therefore be it resolved that the mayor and the city council support the award of a license by the Massachusetts Department of Public Health for a Hampshire County medical marijuana dispensary to be located in the city of Northampton, subject to its local health, public, uh, public safety, and zoning regulations. Move table. There's been a motion to table. It cannot be debated. Is there a second? Second. Can I clarify? Please. Table till later in the meeting. Till the regulations are passed? That's my suggestion. If they pass. Uh, could the, some, so could the motion is to table. There is no debate. It's not a debate. It's a point of clarification. Could could you expand on that? The the reason. Just explain okay. it to me. That's all. I, I mean, well, it, it just it, it says that it refers. This resolution actually refers to rules we haven't approved yet. I believe this is Council Freeman Daniels. Okay. Yeah. Is, am I right? Coming up this evening. Yes. Okay. That's right. Okay. All right. So the icy cold chill that everyone just experienced. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor of tabling. Or postponing. Till later this evening. Or postponing till uh, uh, later in the meeting. This is a move to table. The, the, the till later. It's a motion to table. The table. To uh, council. Under the rules, the, the chair can unilaterally move it later in the agenda unless there's objection. So if you just want to do that, we don't need a vote. Would everyone be okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's fine. All right. That that would be my decision. Then we'll wait until after we've uh, we deliberated the, uh, the the ordinances, um, which. Also, given that I am vested with that great power, I will move up in the agenda, given the fact that the audience is here. <laughs> can, can, is there one any, without any objection? Can we just do the petition first? Yes, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, we'll do the petition first, and then we'll go on to the ordinances, and then the resolution. How's that? Sounds good. Um, I see a lot of nodding heads out in the audience, so that's, that's encouraging. Okay. Um, this is a petition. Um, you heard it referred to in public comment. This is uh, uh, the undersigned pursuant to Mass General Law 8221 petition the city, uh, Northampton City Council to accept Bottoms Road as a city street. And then it is it is signed. And as I now let me see, I have to be clear on this. We it's a referral. Um, it can be a referral. Now, um, just in uh, counselors, just so we're clear on this on this process here. This can be a referral back to the um, Board of Public Works for a petition to have for acceptance. But uh, the history indicates that this has come from them already. They've gone through this and reviewed this, and there were a number of residents on Bottoms Road who were represented at the meeting. Um, there was also a suggestion that there was lack of proper notification by some, um, some of the applicants. Although you'll find if you look in your packets that there is um, representation that everyone was notified in timely manner. This is about a year ago, right? About a year ago. So it, it's up to you. If we accept this and refer it, then we start the process over. If you're, if you're so inclined not to accept it, then that's the end of the issue. Uh, I would move over. referral to the Planning Board and the Board of Public. I second so, that. Okay. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on that? Yeah, I think that. Uh, can we amend the um, referral to also to the City Council Conference, Conference Committee, Committee with the Board of Public Works? 
Uh, any objection? No. Nope. Can I get a second? Okay. A second. Second. Okay. Second on that. All right. So the the motion is to refer to the Board of Public Works and the Conference Committee. Any other discussion? And, those and to planning. Yeah. And to planning. I'm sorry. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. All right. Do you want me to do uh, the right? Who wants to do one minute announcements just to hold everyone in these hard seats a little longer? Does anyone have any one minute announcements? No? I'll, I'll uh, um, oh, Council of Arts. Um, Veterans Day Parade, just a reminder on that. Um, we are, it's going to assemble at 10 o'clock a.m. And the parade departs at 11 o'clock a.m. And we will be meeting at the Latham Park on Bridge Street. So hopefully all the counselors will be planning to attend and march on that. Also, there will be a continental breakfast for Northampton veterans on Tuesday, November 12th, from 9.30 to 10.30 at the Northampton Senior Center. And if you have any questions, please call the Senior Center at 587-1228, Thursday, November 7th, to register. So that's that. And that, then that I would have be another. today, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Get down and to that's it. the second annual Safe School Summit, which you all received an email from our council clerk. I've got my registration in already, and I think it's an excellent <clears throat> summit to attend, and I'm hoping that you counselors really <coughs> like that. And then I have one more. The Florence Civic and Business Association. We need to look at our 24th annual holiday parade on Saturday, November 30th. And we will be assembling at the Trinity Row Park at 9.30 a.m. and the parade will begin at 10 o'clock a.m. That's Thank it. Thank you, Council Murphy. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to mention that Florence Civic will be sponsoring a forum on stormwater on November 13th. 13th at Friday. Seven, uh, at it's Friday the 13th. No, it's a Wednesday. It's <laughs> It's a Wednesday, and um, so I want to invite invite anybody can come, but particularly Ward Five re residents. And I think Councillor Tacey's extending. We're Florence, Florence Civic covers five and seven mostly, so uh, anyone's welcome and from anywhere in the city. What's the time on that? Seven o'clock. Seven. Thank you. Any other one minute announcements? <coughs> All right. This is the ordinance. In the year 2013, <coughs> upon the recommendation of the Planning Board, this is an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the Code of Ordinances, City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising Section 350-2.1, 8.1, 11.2, 11.6 of said code, providing that regulate medical marijuana and ensure traffic mitigation and include specific project fact-based analysis. Be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton, the City Council assembled as follows. That uh, Section 350-2.1, 8.1, 11.2, 11 11.6 of Code of Ordinances of the City of the Northampton, uh, Massachusetts be amended so that such section shall read as follows. Insert the following definition in alphabetical order, no other changes to section. Definition, Medical Marijuana, Medical Marijuana Treatment Center, MMTC, and Registered Marijuana Dispensary, RMD, defined and regulated by Massachusetts General Laws and the Massachusetts Department of Health Regulations, and along with any related land use owned, controlled, or contracted by the, <coughs> by the MMTC where marijuana may be present. Medical marijuana is a subset of the medical uses medical dispensaries and is allowed in any facilities where new physicians offices new dispensaries and pharmacies may be located but not locations where medical uses and dispensaries are allowed only as a pre-existing non-conforming use and for any growing or processing without dispensaries in any industrial area also this is uh 350-8.1 off street parking um, medical dentist offices and delete transportation terminal and replace with medical marijuana dispensaries, 200 feet of gross floor area. Uh, um, let's see, and then projects requiring site plan approval 
as intermediate projects. Insert new subsection F as shown. No other changes to the section. No building permit, zoning permit, or special permit shall be issued for the following intermediate projects prior to review and approval of the site plan in accordance with this section. Um, uh, projects which involve new construction or additions of between 2,000 square feet and 5,000 square feet of gross floor area, area excluding single-family dwellings, expansions in the CB district uh, that do not involve footprint expansions and projects used exclusively for agriculture, horticulture, or floriculture. Mr. Mr. President, isn't it just that we're adding medical marijuana facilities to site, site plan approval? Yes, that is. You, you see, <coughs> Councilor Freeman Daniels asked that I cut to the chase. <laughs> <laughs> So section F is the addition of medical marijuana facilities, which is a much shorter sentence. Um, uh, the approval criteria, um, this is, uh, amend paragraph B2 is shown to ensure a rational nexus between any traffic impacts and any necessary traffic mitigation. And the amended language reads now, in lieu of traffic mitigation payment, shall be assessed by the planning board after a fact-based analysis of a specific project, but shall not exceed that that uh, shown in the table below. Past experience has been that mitigation of all traffic impacts would be higher than maximum amount allowed, and so many projects are assessed the maximum allowed by the table. And then second, insert the following into the first line of the table showing the commonly required payment for in lieu of, pay uh, in lieu of payments to fund a project's proportional share of necessary improvements to mitigate off-site traffic impacts Requirement payment uh, for MEND mitigation fee table as follows. Any medical marijuana uh, project, regardless of the district, will be $2,000 per peak trip. And that's regardless of all other entries below. And then third and last, insert in the table showing how peak hour trips are calculated, um, which now includes medical marijuana added to grocery, personal services, retail, and auto sales. Um, added to that language, fourth, is insert the improve the approval criteria, and this is the approval criteria. Medical marijuana operations shall meet the following criteria. A, hours of operation for any sale to the public and any distribution and delivery of marijuana shall be limited to 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. B, building facades and property must be consistent with the character of the neighborhood, including such items as transparent storefront windows with a view into the interior of the building. Security measures must appear from outside of the building to be consistent with the character of the neighborhood. This does not create any restriction or compromise on security measures, but does require that such measures be camouflaged to blend into the background. <coughs> C, buildings must be ventilated with such filters or scrubbers to ensure that there are no odors from marijuana in any place where the public or clients are present and no public exposure to any pesticides, herbicides, or other chemicals. And then D, no medical marijuana dispensary and or treatment center shall be located within 200 feet of any elementary school, middle school, high school, or college, or university. Move to vision. I'm sorry? I'd like to divide this question. You want to divide it? Yep. Okay. I'd like to divide 350.11.6. Okay. Uh, approval criteria, uh, paragraph two. Okay. Do you want to speak to that first? Second. Okay. The motion's been made and seconded, and dividing the issue, uh, dividing the issue. So, I, it's not debatable. But I can. The reason is that I, I'm not sure. It looks to me that there are two substantive things here. One is a change to uh, par traffic mitigation, and another is a, is a, the insertion of medical marijuana facilities here. And I'd like to take them separately. Um, any other discussion on that? No, it's not debatable. All those in favor of dividing? Aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed. Any abstentions? Okay. Would you like to move? Oh, yeah, I'd like to move the um, everything but uh, okay. all paragraph right. 2. <laughs> so, all right. So there's Second. a motion. Of 11 6. Okay. Um, for, before we start, uh, the council, I'll accept a motion to recognize uh, Wayne Fiden. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Wayne, thank you. Do you want me to talk about? Both ordinances now, or just 11 6 to start with? Let's start <coughs> with the uh, ordinance in total minus that sub. Okay. So. okay. So, um, in terms of medical marijuana, just to be clear, if you do nothing, medical marijuana is, is legal in this state. 
uh, and it's legal, it would be legal in Northampton. Um, there's a challenge with our ordinance, which is we lump things together. So we have retail and personal service establishments <laughs> are allowed in some districts, medical offices are allowed in other districts. So there's really uh, two main reasons to pass this from my standpoint. The first is to clarify that yes, they're legal in which districts we think they're legal on. This isn't liberalizing anything, it's basically, so some communities are saying it's only allowed in some districts. The proposed language here is saying it's allowed in exactly the districts it would be if you didn't do anything, which is to say any place where doctors are allowed, any place where pharmacies are allowed, because those are in essence what these look and feel like. Um, so that's sort of the, the, main, the main important point is we're not trying to limit where they go in town. The second reason it's important is to spell out specific criteria for how we deal with mitigation. Um, if you did nothing, the only mitigation would be the state standards, which creates a certain separation between medical marijuana uses and other uses. In writing our own ordinance, planning board and ordinance committee are recommending different numbers in terms of separation between medical marijuana uses and other uses, and then also mitigating other impacts, um, most specifically about traffic. We, we major projects, we mitigate traffic impacts. Medical marijuana is no different from other major projects. It will have a lot of traffic. So in some ways, the planning board was most concerned by the traffic aspects. If you remember, the state is guaranteed to issue one license per state, I mean, per, per county, minimum 19 licenses, and no more than 35, at least for this first round. That means these things that are being permitted are gonna be fairly high volume businesses. So we're at traffic and, and parking. So that section is really basically just the meat and potatoes of site plan of how do we mitigate those impacts. Any questions? Councilor Freeman Daniels. Thank you. Um, Director Fiden, I, uh, I noticed that um, no other, I mean, from how I'm reading the ordinance, uh, from how I'm reading the ordinance, um, no other um, facility of any kind is regardless of um, its district, its zoning, it's the district it's in, except for medical marijuana. That's correct. Um, that's that's surprising to me that uh, that the planning board believes, uh, since you're, you're representing, or are you representing the planning board or the, the, your your uh, we're both planning boards. Okay. So it's it's surprising that that the planning board believes that the greatest threat to traffic in this city of all the different kinds of development that we could have is medical marijuana. Uh, I I think that uh, I, I don't understand why it's not integrated with uh, with the um, central business uh, and uh, general business. Um, provisions that doesn't have uh, traffic mitigation. The um, issue is that the, the reason for the exemption in central business district and general business in particular is we get a lot of trip chaining. You, you, people come downtown and you go to multiple businesses at the same time. Medical so at least from, our, from research we've done in other states, medical marijuana trips tend to be less likely to be a trip chaining. A lot of people who are, who are buying the product are sick, and they're going out, and they're buying the product, and they're going back in. And so we think there's more distinct trips that's out there. Um, but, I mean, even more so, I mean, even more than medical offices and other kinds of pharmacies that are in the same zone. Well, as a practical matter, we almost don't get, we don't get new medical offices downtown. Um, because most offices, are, and we have some small offices that are left, but most medical offices have moved away from downtown. They want places that are easy access. Well, that's central right. business, but Florence. In central business, right. But Florence is. We get some there, general absolutely. General business. Right. So uh, I'm, um, okay, I, I understand the re I understand what you're saying, I, but I don't agree with the, uh, the reasoning. Uh, consultation. <clears throat> well, I understand that like, places like CVS are not gonna sell pot. Right, they sell Oxycontin, but they don't sell it. <laughs> <laughs> they don't get it. You're talking about prescription medication. And it's not going to be dispensed by a pharmacist. I just, uh, <laughs> just don't get it. These are sort of the cards we're dealt with. I don't disagree. The state is requiring medical marijuana dispensaries be selling only one product, marijuana, whether it's, you know, whatever form it is, that's the product that they can sell. Um, 
And so, yes, CVS can't legally sell. Now, as a practical matter, given the federal laws, I don't think CVS would want to sell it. Right. So uh, that may be part of it, but, but legally, we don't get a choice about that. Medical marijuana places, for at least now, will be separate businesses. So we'll dispense prescription medication in a place without a pharmacist. That's okay, I guess. I guess somebody else has thought about it. Put it together. Council Barsh, you have a question? Yeah. I kind of like feel the same way Councillor Casey does. So, in other words, say as an example, I wanted to go ahead and rent off a space that qualifies for what the speculations are. I don't have to be a pharmacist. I can just go ahead and be an owner of the business and distribute it. As well, long as that person has the identification and has been approved right by doctors or whoever they go through to get that marijuana. So in essence, there's two approval processes. You as a business person would need to get a license from the state as Department of Public Health. And they have an extremely rigorous process. I can't tell you what pharmacists go through. But it's not that someone can just walk in and get a license. So they've gone through They finished the first round of, of Approvals that was where we ended up with five applicants in Hampshire County um, now going through the second round. So I don't think it's a matter of somebody who's not qualified being able to open a business because the state is, is licensing those things. In any case, the state is sort of covering the field as what the basic rules are. So they're the ones who write the basic rules where we have authority is Communities couldn't even ban medical marijuana, but we have authority within our community, where is it allowed, and how do we mitigate impacts. Um, so whether it should be a pharmacist or should be some license to buy public health, we don't get to decide. Okay, so they do have to, whoever has to take or be qualified through the state in order to open up that facility. Again, for this first round, there are only up to 35 uh, dispensaries for the entire state, and there's a lot more applications than that. So they get a lot more flexibility to narrow them down on, on the criteria that they're using. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Tacey. So they're just this hypothetically, then, marijuana is not going to be the prescription of marijuana is not going to be contraindicated with a different drug. It's not going to have any adverse effects, you know. Lots of times pharmacists, they catch it when you get a prescription. They say, well, you're on this. You really shouldn't be on this. So there's probably, the, there must not be any implication there, huh? You're outside of my expertise. Yeah, that's why so I, I, I know. I assume that's point of order, Mr. Doctor. Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay. Point of order. The, the, okay. These issues are actually not within our purview. I mean, yeah. this has already been what the state has said. We may like it or not like it, but what we're deciding is, are we going to set, what, what are the rules that we are allowed to make? Are we going to make those or not? So it's not really the issue about the larger issues about whether it should be sold in a pharmacy or not. So my the the reason and normally I would have moved to disallow some of the conversation, but I think given the fact that it's a conversation that is these are a number of questions are being asked or questions that are in a lot of people's minds. Yeah. Okay. I think and, and, and 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 we're still staying within the color of it. I think. Uh, no, I think it's okay. Yeah. I just wanted to. I think we can even keep discussing them. I just want to make I, sure we separate it out between what we can right. do and a philosophic debate, which we may want to still have. Right. Uh, Councilor Carney. Um, I'm not sure if this is the portion that was separated out. So about, I have just, a question about the, the Just 200. paragraph two. Just paragraph two. Just paragraph two. Is it the reference to the 200 feet? No. No, no okay, it's the, the okay. approval criteria as well. Okay. Thank you. I just, in terms of breaking it to paragraphs. Okay. Um, so I was struck at the ordinance committee meeting about when we looked at the map, um, especially in the commercial district, downtown in that stretch of King Street, of how many areas were excluded or would have been excluded by um, the 500-foot rule. And I know this, this, this discussion came up. Um, it doesn't come up too often, but it did come up under adult use legislation some number of years ago, that really the, we have a pretty small, um, uh, that it's, it's difficult the way that the city of Northampton is uh, spread out in terms of uh, business districts and where places could locate. And so such a restriction, I can understand why the planning board looked at the 500 feet and really looked at what was available for space. And, um, and that became clear when we looked at the map. 
So um, I definitely um, am, su am supporting the reduction from the 500 to the uh, 200 feet. And I could even be persuaded, uh, and I think we talked about this in Ordinance Committee, um, to allow um, uh, more available space to be used um, by looking at that specific restriction and, uh, limit and reducing that as well. But maybe you could talk for the audience here uh, watching about how limited that would be with the. So, so the state standards, which apply in any community which doesn't pass their own ordinance, is 500 feet from any school and any daycare facility and any place where the youth congregate, which isn't as well defined as I would like it to be. If you did that, you'd suddenly eliminate most of the places we allow pharmacies. You'd allow <laughs> eliminate Main Street and Florence. You'd allow it just on King Street and strip areas. Um, and so, the, and 500 feet, just in terms of numbers, 500 feet is about two city blocks. Well, um, it's typically the distance, if you're like most Americans, it's typically the distance that you are willing to walk from your car to where you're going. That if you're going within 500 feet of your car, most people will park and walk. If you're going 600 feet, most people will get back in their car and drive. So, you know, that's typical distance. Um, planning board and then ordinance committee is suggesting reducing it in two ways. The first, the significant one, is this is going from 500 feet to 200 feet. The other one that's probably actually more significant is we're only talking about this from schools, colleges, and universities. So we're not talking about daycare because most six-year-olds are not buying marijuana legally or not legally. And we're not talking about places where youth congregate because that's very difficult to define. Um, and so that really is going to drop more areas. As a practical matter, when we look at those rings, when we look at where schools are, um, it is 200 feet around Smith College, which eliminates a very small amount of Upper Main Street. It's 200 feet around schools, which eliminates a tiny portion on State Street by the Smith Campus School. And I believe I'll have to look at a map to make sure that all the other schools are more than 200 feet from an area which would be eligible anyway. Actually, today, Montessori School, although they, you know, they'd be moving, but they would, so those would eliminate fairly small areas. And just to follow up to that, so if we did enact this legislation and a um, facility were to locate in a legal area now, what would the impact be if then a, a school were to locate there at some time in the future? So zoning is proactive. When you come in, your use is then grandfathered. So okay. if you come into a place and a school locates, you're grandfathered. It could be an issue if you want to expand it. So you come into a place and you're happy with your business, you can stay there forever, whatever happens around you. Mm -hmm. You want to come back next week and double it, then that could be an issue. Okay. Uh, consultation. There's no inventory limit in this, is there? No. Council Freeman Daniels. Uh, I do think that there are going to be some amendments that might be flying fast and furious to this. Um, so I'd like to get mine in and get every, all the council to vote it down before us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's that uh, the amendment to the um, uh, after it, in approval criteria, not in V2, but afterwards, any medical marijuana project outside of central business, general business, EBGI, and OI zoning districts. That's my amendment. Can you repeat the amendment one more time so that Mary can it's it's um, on the on the on the last page at the top under um, any medical marijuana project regardless of the district to eliminate regardless of the district and uh, to put in outside of CB, GB, EB, GI, and OI zoning districts. Uh, basically, make it consistent with. Um, uh, in, with, in many ways with uh, the previous, the, with, with the rest of the, of the parking, uh, traffic mitigation. Um, and that's my, propo that's my proposed amendment. And uh, I'll, I'll wait for a second before I'll second I, it. For okay, thanks. So. Okay. so for purposes of discussion, you want to expand Yeah, on my that? reasoning on this is that um, I think that uh, th uh, this traffic mitigation um, based, regardless of district, would uh, make it uh, very difficult for a medical RMD to um, to provide um, significant um, 
improvements without a lot of without having a lot of money in some of the more developed districts central business general business are the two examples that come to mind um, the city already so I think that this is onerous I also think that the city already has um, uh, parking uh, supply in these districts that's a reason for eliminating the mitigation for every other use uh, and so I don't think that uh, the medical marijuana use is um, outside of the bounds of basically every other use in these districts. So uh, that's why I'd like to, uh, that's the reasoning. Um. <laughs> CBGB. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, EB, GI, and OI. Yeah, I was going to yeah, say, I would would like, that's what I was, I was saying, what to saith that. Wayne to that. I think you answered it earlier. but So, yeah, I mean, again, our concern is, so um, there was a workshop that was uh, uh, done by Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. They brought in both attorneys of the national practice and distributors from Denver so we sort of understand what's going on out there. And what they were saying is if typical customers purchasing uh, about two ounces, um, Again, Denver, our experience may be different here. Um, but we're dealing, and, and so if there's only 35 of these state <coughs> laws, and you're dealing with 1% to 3% of the population in the entire state, that's a lot of customers. Um, and so you'll be dealing with a lot of volume of business. Many of these areas we're talking about, central business less than the other ones, although even central business, um, are not as pedestrian friendly as we'd like them to be. Um, and so we're dealing with a large volume of business we should be dealing with. We should be addressing those things. These are, you know, we, we treat each business differently, and this is a business that's going to be among the highest volume of traffic we get for any businesses. I think these are a good thing. This isn't a criticism whatsoever. The other thing is I will say this has been reviewed by at least two of the applicants, potential applicants, and no one's expressed a concern about it. And uh, this is based on speculative catchment because, of course, we haven't had medical marijuana to date, and you're going based on other studies in other states. Although Denver, it's marijuana is legal to everybody, so the, but the, you're based on previous so dispensaries. Denver was legal. Denver actually had something like yeah. 300 dispensaries, so that you'd actually expect less business per dispensary than Massachusetts that has 30. Will have 35 states. Uh, Councilor Spector and then Councilor Labarge and then Councilor Schwartz with. Was this issue discussed at length when it came up at the planning board when they planning discussed board, yeah, this? Ordinance committee they voted on it, but there wasn't much discussion. But at the planning board, when there was a lot of discussion, um, was was there a specific vote around this? And if so, what was the vote? It was part of the overall specific discussion about it when they first sponsored it. Okay. Um, Councilor Labarge, if you allow me, Councilor Schwartz has sure. a chance to ask. Sure. Sure. Um, I guess I I feel like. Um, what you're calling an onerous burden, if we're not, he it, I don't want to say that because we, they didn't hear from the people in time, maybe upon reflection and with this debate, they'd stand up and go, yes, yes, spare us this, but I'm hard pressed to call something an onerous burden that the people who would experience it are not expressing as an onerous burden when in fact there's evidence that suggests uh, it's warranted and the revenue, you know, mitigation fees are really in important. Um, and so I, I just, I feel very compelled to follow the best evidence that we have, which isn't, you know, which is limited inherently because we haven't done it here yet. But um, I would want to support this as written. Council Labarge and Council Murphy. Yes. Wayne, I was a little concerned on the fourth part of it about the odors of marijuana. Uh, uh, Council, we're, we're speaking on an amendment. Oh, I'm uh, sorry. So, so if we could speak to that. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have any questions on the amendment? No. Uh, Councilor Murphy. And, and this is for Councilor Freeman Daniels, or, or, or actually both, because I'm sure you have opinions and they may actually be different. Um, make a correlation between $2,000 per peak trip and relief of the issue. You know, um, I, I'm going to be putting one of these in, and somebody does the math, and Presto, they come up with 12 peak trips, and that's $24,000 or whatever the math is. How does that relieve the problem? Where does, how, how is that money, if we make this happen, how is that money actually going to mitigate the issue? That was a question directed to you, yeah. But I think that Wayne is, has a yeah, long right. I mean, history with this. I mean, it is expertise so, from transportation so parking. what I can say is that um, I, uh, Wayne and I, um, 
I think we all, I think Wayne and I agree that uh, the more money we can put in the city's coffers for traffic mitigation means the more pedestrian projects we can, we can get accomplished. Uh, I mean, it's, it's actually, I don't think that's really up for debate. The more money you have, the more things you can get accomplished. Yes. But, but the, um, but, uh, so, and so what I foresee is um, probably more than 12 per, uh, um, I mean, I, I perceive quite a, quite a, this being a significant bill. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure whether um, the, uh, the applicants realize that. Uh, um, I, I don't. I don't know. I don't. I can't. I don't know whether they looked at this as a significant bill. And I. But I do think that this will be a significant bill. Uh, and I. And I don't think that. Uh, and in fact, we're, we're not treating. We don't treat different businesses differently. We treat zones differently. Um, so every other business, every other business. I mean, you could, you, know, you could think about these popular nightclubs in, in, in Northampton where the, the traffic gets, is very, it's very high, right? Every other business we treat the same except for the medical marijuana facilities. So what, what happens in other, in other um, districts uh, for traffic mitigation is that a dollar amount is calculated and I, I'm speaking now for Wayne for the most part, but a dollar amount is calculated. And um, the planning board will, will ask for, or, or, or staff will ask for particular upgrades. And if the, um, and if the applicant doesn't want to do them, they'll just pay the money. Uh, and um, so, but you, the problem is that many of these issue, many of these within, the, within these uh, districts, um, there's not a lot of space for, to to create these upgrades. So what what will end up happening is that the applicants, I think, will just pay the money. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think they're going to end up paying a lot of money. And um, I don't know if that, I, like I said, I, I, just because they haven't said it doesn't mean that it's not going to be onerous. Um, and, um, and and maybe, uh, maybe Wayne can, can elaborate. But what we end up doing with these funds is we usually group them. We gr take them from different projects and group them into one mm -hmm. bucket and then try to do something significant for it, like for instance, central business, we might try to shorten the crosswalks or something like that. But it's ex that's expensive, so we'd have to take. But it, it does not necessarily re relate to the specific property that the money came from. So it has to I be might put my to a next, uh, it has to be connected in some respect. Okay, yeah, so like, you can't. This wouldn't provide speed humps and lead somewhere when the things on King no, Street. No, it has to be in a nexus, in yeah, vicinity okay. to that's affect that problem. There, that's right. right. But I, but I just I want to re I just want to emphasize this is the only kind of business, the only kind of business that we're singling out for general business and central business. And, and, and to that point, I would like to add that we do not craft law based on the will or the desire or the level of complaint by a specific applicant. We're creating zoning. We're not creating an application process for any clients. So in that sense, we have to be fair and we have to be consistent because and I remember the debate that came up when we were talking about King Street zoning and the resistance to uh, parking mitigation fees and, and, and so on for, for some of the same reasons. And my concern here is that we find uh, we have a situation where applicants are eager for obvious reasons to, to establish here, given, as you said, uh, there's a potential for a pretty good guaranteed business that we may be, by special rule, exploiting that eagerness and uh, while that sounds tempting, it also doesn't sound fair. Yeah. So um, two important rules. One is Councilor Freeman Daniels mentioned one that's critical, which is the we can only spend the money in the area which benefits that business. That's required. That's why we hold a fair amount of money because projects come in, we have to spend it in that area that benefits them. The other one which we're going to talk about more when we get to the other ordinance which you've separated, but. Um, we need to show that there's a direct proportionate impact from a project. So if a project comes in and their fee would be $40,000 and we can only just show that they're going to have a $30,000 impact, that we need to do $30,000 in mitigation, we can't charge them the extra piece. So we have to do a case-by-case, fact-based situation. So if, in fact, someone's coming downtown and it's not going to have an adverse impact in terms of pedestrian safety and traffic, then we wouldn't be charging them. We have, you know, we have to, to do that case by case assessment. Uh, Councilor Tacey. So, do they base the 35 locations on 
on what? On the number of prescriptions they anticipate? Uh, Councilor, I'm sorry, we are speaking on an amendment. I know. I just, you'll, you'll have an we'll opportunity all together, though. Councilor, we can get to your question if you yeah. just vote yes on this amendment. <laughs> <laughs> you'll have an opportunity to weigh in on that, but uh, we, we are speaking on the amendment, and so that we can get out of here before we age out, mm -hmm. that we'll do it, it according to protocol, if you, if you don't mind. And there and, seems to be so much speculation. And I think those are valid questions. I don't discount it as a valid question. It's just not speaking to the amendment. So if, if we could speak to the amendment, then as, as Council Freeman Daniels, we either vote it up or down, then we can move on to those questions. Are there any other questions to the amendment? Yeah, I'll address it in a second. But what I guess I'm hearing is that on one side we're saying this, this business is being treated unfairly, kind of we're shaking down the, uh, th this facility. And your response was, well, there are specific reasons for that because of the kind of traffic. And then Councilor Daniels said, well, we have other businesses similar, a nightclub. I guess I'd like to hear that response to, are there other businesses that are similar? Or is this a, a real unique case of this business has this particular kind of traffic and that's why we need to do this in this particular case? I guess the honest answer is some of both. I mean, certainly there's other very high traffic generators, and I think that's a good example, which doesn't, you know, which is exempt downtown. Um, two things. One is this is tends to be, on a per square foot basis, probably one of the highest traffic generators per square foot. These, many of these uses tend to be fairly small, so they're not going to generate as much. I mean, Walgreens, for example, on King Street paid about $150,000 in traffic mitigation. It's the same formula for Walgreens. It's a much bigger square footage. So these things you'd expect to pay much less. So, so the volume is definitely maybe unique for these things. The trip chaining is the other piece. And obviously, many <coughs> people go to a nightclub and then go home. But I would argue that one of the reasons that Northampton is successful in the hospitality business and Springfield maybe less so is that Springfield has wonderful restaurants and wonderful nightclubs but they don't make a whole story. So you go in, you meet somebody at a restaurant, and then you leave. Northampton, when I meet friends, I meet downtown, and then we figure out where we're going. Um, and so there's that more of that synergy of, of making it together. I don't think I'm like, and, and some people will. Some people will get tea after buying their medical marijuana. But given the amount of cash I have to bring in when I'm buying the product, you know, so on the average, maybe $800 in cash I'm bringing in, because they don't take credit cards. And given that a product I'm leaving with, it's unlikely I'm going to spend a lot of time with $800 in my cash or two ounces of marijuana in my pocket. So, and, and that's been borne out at least by the experience in, in Denver. Um, the, the, so, so that's the part that's unique about it. Councilor Adams and Councilor Murphy. I, I support this amendment. I think it's not only unfair, in my opinion, it's punitive. And, um, and I support the amendment and I call the question. Questions been called? Uh, roll call on this. Is there, would you repeat the amendment? Yeah, that any medical it's marijuana project outside of central uh, CB, GB, EB, GI, and OI zoning districts, $2,000 per peak trip, regardless of other entries below. Point of you want to delete? Uh, re delete regardless of the district. Right. Point of information. I, I just moved to call the question. It, the council can vote it down if they, they want more discussion on this matter. Okay, so the <coughs> question's been called. Is all, all the, the question's being called. Uh, all those in favor of uh, calling there, the question? There's no second. I'm sorry. There's no second. Okay. Is there a second? Second. There is a second. All those in favor of closing? Aye. No nope. calling for the amendment. For the amendment. Yeah. Yeah. Aye. 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 Okay. Debate is closed. Question's called. Roll call, please. We're calling, uh, this is a roll call for the amendment that is as iterated by um, Councilor Freeman Daniels. Councilor Connie? No. Councilor Boyd? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Lavar? No. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? No. Councilor Stockton? No. No. Yes. Okay. But it's zoning. But it's zoning. 
That's, that's for the final ordinance. It's for amendment. It's just for the amendment. amendment. Yes, yeah, so that's okay. It doesn't have the same. Does it, is, is that the rule? I mean, does the, does the amendment? Oh, well, that's a good rule? question. I don't, I don't the answer. Yeah, we, we conduct normal business until until the zoning. Yeah. Uh, the, until the, the zoning vote. That's what I understand is that, that, we, that, that those thresholds come for the final vote. This is on an amendment. Okay. So the amendment passes then? Uh, there were, the vote was four yes, five no. Um, all right, back to the, the main motion. The main motion that does not include <laughs> the <laughs> approval criteria. <clears throat> no, it did not pass. If the motion fails, the amendment failed. That, right, and 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 it's my understanding. We'll find out, of course, but I'm pretty sure. And I, I think Councilor Freeman Daniels agrees with me that that um, the those criteria apply to the final vote on the final disposition of the ordinance, Mr. Chairman. And it doesn't matter anyway because it only had four votes. It just would have meant it needed six right, votes. Six so to it's passed, not it, to fail. For future reference, yeah. for future reference yeah. we would know. But yeah. So the amendment fails. We're back to the main motion minus the approval criteria. Everything but 11.6. We're he's only separated one. <coughs> that's the second paragraph, uh, the approval criteria. So we're talking about the, everything else but the approval criteria. Everything else but paragraph two of the approval criteria. Thank you. Yes. 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 Yeah. I'm sorry. So paragraph two. Has this part been moved yet? Uh, this has been moved. Oh, it's based on the floor. That's why he was able to amend it. <laughs> okay. Good. Correct. And then he. Still on just. 11, the 11 6 B2. You didn't do anything with 11 2. You just. That's right. Just 11 part. 6 B2, the bottom part of <coughs> page 2. And, and the rest has been moved. And that's what we're back to discussing. And, Councillor Tacey, the question that you were queuing up. You're invited to ask now. Right now, we're debating and discussing the rest. The, rest. the rest, as it were, yes, as opposed to the approval criteria, which will be separate. Okay. okay. Councilor Tacey, did you want to ask your question? <laughs> Mary, I feel your pain. I'm as damn confused about it as you are. <laughs> Trying to keep all the. Uh, yeah, my, the 30, the, my question about the 35 locations throughout the state, I, I, it just I, I, it baffles me how they're going to, how, how you would figure this out and how you would. I remember when they wanted to put this a little bit off the record, but they had a drive up window at the Pride Station. They said, well, they're going to have probably maybe 100 cars going through there in a day. Look at what they've got. <laughs> it's uh, I'm just, I wonder where you're going to put this, and the, the traffic is the biggest deal here for me. And did they base the 35 locations on the number of prescriptions they feel they're going to put out in a particular region? Or I, I, I don't know, frankly. I, I just know that what the buzz is, what the buzz is accurate. I mean, if they got 25,000 <laughs> prescriptions yeah. per month in this <laughs> in, in in Worth. county, <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm curious as to. Uh, are we going to handle them all in Northampton? So I believe the reason they're limiting the number is they just want to go slow. That I assume there will be additional rounds in the future for more dispensaries, but they only want to handle so many as they get the, the as they get the the kinks out of the system. To make sure it works. So, so we, I'm sure there'll be additional rounds. So if we get so definitive on this, are we going to will we offering changes to it as we as we go along? Will we revisit this? So, like all zoning, I, I of course think we're brilliant. We never need to come back. But if yeah. two months from now we realize we've done wrong, yes, we're coming See it all back. the time. So, yeah. Right. So we have no plans to come back, but absolutely we're learned from not only our experience, but you can guess there's lots of listservs buzzing around the state. So as we learn from experience in other states, as we learn from experience within this state, we're amend as necessary. And I so, assume public uh, health, the state public health will amend their roots. So when we do locate these facilities, we'll look at bus routes and things such as that? and. Right. So availability. Remember, zoning, zoning is proactive. So whoever gets licensed, we don't get another crack at them. Um, other uses we may. Public health regulations are not proactive. 
So the state or the city board of health could adopt regulations. They found some safety issue that's out there. They can change the rules that automatically apply to existing businesses. That's not, that's not the zoning part. It's only going to be for new businesses. But if the state suddenly says, okay, we need a different kind of licensing of owners, we want to have a test of owners, the state has the right to do that and to change the license. Yeah, one eighteen. Oh, yeah, Councilor Freeman Daniels. It takes a minute to come up with these. All right, take well, I'll time. wait. I'll, I'll yield to Councilor Tacy. Councilor Tacy. Uh, one eighteen Con Street. Where is that located? Down here. I know it's down there somewhere. Where is it? It's the old medical, uh, old medical yes. building down across from the uh, Gazette. Okay. Yeah. Way down, by Pleasant Journey. Yes. 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 Doctor's office. Yep. Which is already close a huge traffic as we get down to uh, where we're going to put a roundabout at some point because of the traffic is so bad. I'm just trying to be careful as to where you would place, and I haven't got. I think it needs. I need. I think it needs a lot of a lot of discussion. No. Council, oh, I, I'm done. Okay, Council Freeman Daniels or Council Adams, did you? you can call okay. Up. Yeah, I'll take another stab at an amendment here. Um, on, uh, I'd like to move to amend uh, under approval criteria 4D. No medical marijuana dispensary and/or treatment center shall be located within 200 feet of an elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or university. This is now we're on to the second portion on the. Um, so, the last sentence of the whole. Order. But that has not been moved yet. No, no. This is the, the approval criteria. Mr. President, the only thing I wanted to to divide was um, paragraph B two. Just B two. Okay. Mm -hmm. I understand. So you want to strike D? No, I don't want to strike it. Um, I'd like to uh, amend it. Yeah, amend it. Amend um, <clears throat> amend it by striking college or university and um, strike two hundred and replace it with fifty. Recommendations to reduce the buffer to 50 feet. Second. And to strike, and to strike college and university. That's right. No medical marijuana dispensary and or treatment center shall be located within 50 feet of any elementary school, middle school, high school. Period. Uh, motions been made and seconded, and we're going to discuss this amendment now. Uh, Councilor Spain. Could you? Um Discuss again why the 200 foot um, buffer was talked about because we heard earlier from the public comment that there was some question about having no buffer whatsoever and then it was decided on the 200 buffer and why it, the 200 buffer ended up being the one that was proposed. Um, first of all, I, I will say that I don't think the planning board, at least speaking for them, would have any objection to this amendment. Um, th they were trying to find a you know, the there were several advocates from the public health community who were lobbying for bigger numbers and more things, and the planning board was trying to find some compromise. Um, I don't think, again, I don't think there's any problem. As a practical matter, what you do from schools doesn't much matter because there's not a lot of commercial areas around. So the main effect of this change would be the Smith College area, Green Street and, and Upper Main Street. Um, and again, I don't think the planning board have any objection to that. What's important to have something or some of the language is the state says 500 feet applies unless local government's regulating it different. So if you suddenly left it silent, then you'd be back to 500 feet. Um, so having something or other one <coughs> saying we've discussed this. Uh, again, the number I'll leave to you, there's no magic behind them. You know, advocates in the public health community will say this is an issue about um, the messaging that Medical marijuana is important to allow. The voters have asked for that. We're worried about messaging for our youth. What the planning board feels and what a lot of advocates in medical marijuana will say is if someone walking by <coughs> suddenly wants to buy drugs illegally, we have a greater problem. That the security requirements of these places are very strict and that the criminal penalties <coughs> for buying medical marijuana and then selling it are actually greater than the criminal penalties for buying marijuana illegally and then selling it. And so it's unlikely you get the sales that 
as a result of being close by. No one's going to buy it and sell in the back alley. Okay. Can I? Comments? Uh, oh, well, yeah. 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 I just want to remind everyone that also in public comment, we heard from one of the public health people who were advocating for the 500 foot and go to the state regulation and just use that as our default. So, Councilor Adams. <laughs> Um, I par I'll paraphrase the, the you know, planning director a little bit. Uh, what I heard um, from the Board of Health Director and also from um, the Coalition Prevention um, member was that the concern was about, um, as Director Fine said, exposure and messaging. So it was, um, it was, it was a, a sentiment, in my opinion. Um, but again, that I don't think I don't think that I requested some some data that that showed. Um, if there is a higher incidence of, of, of um, marijuana usage when a school is located near a dispensary in the states that have them, or if there's a higher incidence of substance abuse in schools that are located near dispensaries, and there is none available. So um, I think it's, it's, it's nothing more than, than, a, than, a, than a message that I don't really think belongs in the ordinance. As I suggested to the coalition, if there should be a message, then we can put that in, in a resolution that states we don't want marijuana near children, um, near minors, and um, simply because we're approving zoning and a dispensary may come here, that does not mean that we want um, children near the substance and that we agree that marijuana and children don't mix. Um, that's the place to do it, in my opinion, would be in a resolution. But the facts do not support that proximity to a school um, creates any likelihood at all that there will be greater usage of marijuana of minors. Thank you. Councilor LaBarge on the amendment. Now, I, yep. Wayne, on the ordinance that we put in many, many years ago, um, 500 feet um, nude entertainment within the schools, and this one does not have a church on it, so why is there not a church? So, so again, um, I, I think the feeling is it's the messaging about youth that, that public health advocates are worried about. Okay. Um, and that's sort of <laughs> less an issue for, for churches for doing it. And, and I also think it's important <laughs> when you're talking about entertainment, this is not entertainment. And, the, and, and part, and, well, the, the difficulty here is, and it's been the difficulty with this conversation ongoing is marijuana is transitioning from an illegal substance and all the, all the culture and attitudes that go towards that. It is now recognized pretty widely and certainly recognized by the state of Massachusetts as having medicinal purposes. And we're talking about medicinal services. We're not talking about strip clubs. We're not talking about porn stores. We're talking about the equivalent of an apothecary providing healthy alternatives and pain medication for people that that is now legal in the state of Massachusetts. 81% of the people in this community voted in favor of it. The concern is that when we, I think when we bring the debate down to the point where we're, we're classifying or categorizing or considering them the same as adult entertainment, we're doing a horrible disservice to the spirit that was that was emphatically voted to express that this is another alternative for people who are suffering and can be and those that suffering can be abated by a consumption of modified marijuana products it, that's it, it's we are we do not want to turn anyone who's considering entering this business or turning anyone who's considering using this business or being prescribed to this business as uh, a pariah. I mean, it's important that we just, and that's my only concern is that when we, when we have this discussion, and, and the other aspect of this discussion is, of course, because we're all new to this, and when I say we, I'm talking about the state, the caution has been, by my reckoning, excessive, but by others, it's been um, intense. I think we can all agree here that all the criteria that have been established for this, we don't have parallel criteria applying to any other system that's being, uh, that's working like this. It's unique, as Councilor Spector pointed out. And so I don't want to, I, I want us to be careful when we continue, when we consider this, we're talking about authorizing a sanctioned medical dispensary in the community. We're not talking about porn movies and 
and, and strip clubs because that's... I understand that, right. Counselor. I'm concerned about what I had heard from Marissa, mm -hmm. okay, about the amount of footage of the 200, and I was asking a logical question. If we went 50 feet on an ordinance before, I wanted to know what would be the difference here. I'm sorry. I Okay, I was ask, I heard you asking about why didn't we include churches and things like that. And right. That's why I wanted to know. We included... Uh, Councillor, uh, I'm sorry, Wayne, you, were, you wanted to say something. Just one, one suggestion, if, if you ca pass this amendment, um, it's probably worth adding at the end language specifically the fact of there are no other buffer requirements. I wouldn't want, in dropping colleges, I wouldn't want someone to, to say, oh, that means you're going back to the state default of 500 feet. So just spelling it out to say these are our buffer requirements. There are no other buffer requirements. Yeah, I accept that. I, I mean, I wish that that were in there before because we did the, the, uh, the daycare was eliminated, right? But that was in the state one, so. I think you're right. Okay, all right. I should have had it before. Right, good. There we go. So, so uh, we'll put that as a friendly. Would, would you yeah. express a friendly amendment for uh, uh, Mary so that she can. Uh, so, after high school, there would be a um, uh, semicolon, and um, we should say uh, there are no other. Buffer requirements, limitations, uh, limitations, limitations, or uh, limitations. And Councilor Schwartz, I, I feel like the two hundred feet um, feels like a compromise. Um, it feels like uh, we've got a state recommendation that we, the planning board rejected revised um, and revised downward and I, I, I feel like in view of the commentary that we've heard from the public health community and the fact that we have a state recommendation which I, I hear you're calling it excessive caution I think truthfully I will concede that my my frame is influenced anecdotally um, by being the parent of three teenagers and I feel like there is there is a, it, 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 we, we don't, uh, there's a mixed message inherent in this. Mm -hmm. In that there's just, a, I mean, literally, like we're saying, don't use marijuana, but medically, you know, we, we have the level of sophistication to understand the, the incredible need for medical marijuana. And I would prefer there being as much of a buffer as possible in, the, in that messaging, in the exposure that you're talking about, Jesse. I mean, because my issue is not that, therefore, there's, we're going to necessarily track an increase in use. I mean, I, I totally acknowledge the research isn't there for that. There is a, an, an atmosphere, an environment that I would like, I'd like to keep the messaging as clean as possible. And no matter what, it's going to be messy necessarily, appropriately, because um, because medical marijuana is a, is a is a really essential thing for many people. And so that's the dinner table talk as much as you can you know you can do it, but. I have, um, I feel like I have no problem with a little bit of a greater buffer and I feels, and again, again, acknowledging the sort of emotional pull of, on that and that, uh, that may be rebuttable um, on a more intellectual level. Well, you were directing that me in somewhat and if, if I could respond, it's just that um, the sophistication that we ascribe to ourselves about this messaging, I think that messaging is completely lost distance-wise on the people that we're trying to influence. A child doesn't know the difference between a 250-foot buffer or what the message is that's being, trying to be transmitted. I think that, and, and, and as far as mixed messages, this is why Maurice's job is so hard, because that's, we are, we are a culture committed to mixed messages. Why is alcohol and tobacco very lethal systems that have no palliative care value at all allowed to be sold within any school. Totally. So, but then you just, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, yes, so f imperfection doesn't mean but, more imperfection. And I, and as I was saying, is, is to Councillor Adams' point, it's, it's, it's more of feeling, as you expressed, and as more as anyone else is expressing. It's the feeling is not necessarily substantiated with data. Um, that, that 50 feet versus 100 feet versus 200 feet versus a mile. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. is any, has any good or negative impact on a child's impression of what's allowed and what's not allowed, or encouraged and not encouraged? Well, it, there is a practical matter of whether you're more or less likely to walk by it. That's, exactly. that's true, but then... That's just my... That's, that's all. But walking by... I mean, I don't mean... I don't need to hide it. I don't need to hide it. I just... I, I, you know, that's... It's, it's, to me, it's a, it's a great fact of life that this is going to be available to people. It's a great fact of life for those who need it. I just... To me, then I go, okay, I'm confused. There's, this is an emotional thing. I've got the state who that said 500. We got the planning board that said 200. Okay. So that's... I mean, I'm just giving you where I go. Like, that's... I'll land there. And just to clear up the state as Wayne is pointed out, the state's criteria is essentially the default, it's saying in the absence of anyone else acting in any other mode and leaving it up to the community. But in the absence of that, this is the default mode. It's not necessarily the standard that they are saying they're recommending communities abide by. So. Council there. Sure. Uh, Council Tacey. I'm sorry. The, uh, the 200 feet from a school, I mean, I'm trying to think of a school, except, you know, we've got one on maybe Bridge Street where you might possibly have something that close for a school. But well, there's People's the Institute. I, the, the highest traffic areas in, this, in the city are the schools. I mean, then if this is going to incur more traffic, why couldn't it be something like uh, maybe place it in the ordinance where it won't affect or won't uh, impact the uh, already high traffic in the school zones? Um, mine's all about the traffic. I'm on board with medical marijuana. I mean, I think uh, it's about time. Um, I just get very, very cautious about where you place them. Wayne, how are you categorizing People's Institute? It would be a daycare, but it wouldn't be a school. So we're de defining school specifically as, you know, um, elementary, middle, high school, or college, or university. Okay. It's a residential area, too. Isn't it? People's Institute? No. Oh, I think it's at Hill Institute. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Mix the two. What about the James House? Uh, James House. Which is actually an educational facility now. It's the. Um, I think it's the so city it's schools, and Bridge Street School is the only one that is within 200 feet of commercial district. But the James House is kind of a satellite uh, for Greenfield community, and I mean there are. It's going to go back to what you're. What you're dropping I'm wondering if. The, mm -hmm. Right, right. It's, it's adult education. It's adult. Right. So if you're if you're leaving college, <coughs> in, yes, that's your buy right. Okay, but this amendment does two things. It drops the buffer and <coughs> it eliminates the. So, um, Council Murphy. I mean, this really comes down to a feel-good number. Yes. Because we really don't have any mm -hmm. evidence one way or the other. We're whacking the state limit of 500 down to 200, and there's, uh, and there are people that, and, and people who have a stake here that have said, please don't do that. We like 500. I mean, I'm comfortable taking it down to 200, but I don't know if I want to go lower. I, I mean, my feeling is, we can't prove any number. But that dropping it lower is, is considerably more disrespectful to the public health folks who are already upset with us for going to 200. Um, but it really is a feel-good number. By, by the way, I believe the applicants were asking for 200, not 500. Yeah. They were asking for okay 200. You, had, you I think you misspoke and said they were okay with 500. Oh, no, no, the, the, uh, the Board of Health, the right. Coalition, right. those folks. Yeah. Yeah. The applicants are, were happy with two, so we said, fine, we'll get away with that. Go, going below that to me it's just a tad disrespectful and I think the police also chimed in with they like 500 so we're you know I see no need to go below that if that is enough to make everybody happy Councilor, I disagree there's there's disrespect um, this is about what's the best and most sensible policy we can make and that's why I'm considering the lack of data to show any correlation between um, marijuana dispensaries and incidents of, of marijuana usage um, so I, I don't think it's really about a lack of respect or not. I think we've heard them respectfully, and we res some of us respectfully disagree. <clears throat> uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels and Councilor Carney. Um, I'd like to uh, perform some action here. By uh, I'm going to I'd like to withdraw the 50-foot uh, amendment, but keep the striking of college and university. Thank you. So you want to retain the 200-foot buffer? Very good. Yeah, uh, but I need a second on that. I'll second that. I think actually it was Councillor Adams who seconded. He was the original second. So. Second. second. But I will, I will second. No. Seconding that motion. Then, then, then we can't, then we can't withdraw. Can't withdraw. Can't can't withdraw. The, the person had to be friendly. friendly. It's got to be him to be friendly. I was the could, friendly uh, amendment. You could you that. explain, <clears throat> I think I know why, but I, I think it was a good reason why you were even making that suggestion. That's, yep. 
the rationale. I need, a, it. I need a, uh, no, I'm I, not, I think we need Councillor Adams to second. I, I, okay. I'm, I'm so let me say it then, since I'm not, I'm not doing I, it as a motion. Uh, yeah. okay. Actually, I think I sec I gave the friendly amendment but you to. Can't no, it was you can't. Originally, the original amendment was seconded oh. by can't. Councillor Adams. And he refused. So to since okay. I'm not, I'm not making a motion to so change anything. Every order of Robert's Rules of Order, he's sticking with. Right. So, I, I, it's a valuable lesson to everybody. As I, I'm, I'm just rejoining the discussion. I am not <laughs> talking to changing any amendment. However, I think the counselor was picking up on that sense of this is not such a huge thing here, guys. And I think there is just a level of, we talked about messaging in one way about what's the message, whether it's near the school or not, and I agree there's probably not, you know, there's no data on that. But there is a message of saying there was some compromise reached here. And there are some folks, whether it's the police or the public health community, saying 500 feet, you know what we could say, we totally disagree with that. But because it's not that big a thing, and because there is a, a group of people saying we really want this, I sense that what was going on was saying, you know what, let's keep it at the 200 feet. Because I do agree, I think there is some sense of saying, we're not going to listen to you at all on this. And I really do not think, if we look at the practical matter here, it is so insignificant that I would say, let's keep it at the 200 feet with that compromise. Uh, Councilor Carney, then come. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I want to go back. We're actually trying to do th at least two things with this amendment, if I'm correct, Councilor Freeman Daniel. We're trying to um, decrease the buffer, but also take out the reference to college and university. In my sense, that reference to college and university it is important to be deleted from that, first of all, because, you know, those are adults, 18 year old, eighteen and older, and because, you know, there is not just Smith College, but there's also the James House that um, is proximate to many locations. And so I'm afraid that if we, although I understand that the counselor is hesitant to second, to second the, uh, amendment, um, the change, and um, I'm afraid that the amendment will will fail. Um, it can be reintroduced. It, it can be reintroduced, just okay. Point of information, we can vote on this, and then if it fails, we can just do a motion right exactly. after. It, it seems as though it's very close, and it, that seemed odd that you, it, it's close enough that it would be difficult for that to be introduced, but I'll defer to the chair. And so, I, I, um, how about this? Why don't we call the question? on that see if it survives if it doesn't survive then uh counselors are welcome to try again try again okay okay uh, yes the um mary do you have this is the one that would take the from 200 to 50. correct so the reduce the buffer zone down to 50 feet from 200. Eliminate college and, and then eliminate college and universities as as being so college it can be put near college and universities if it survives. So we're going from now two hundred to fifty feet. That is the proposal. That was the amendment that we're gonna vote on now. So <coughs> uh, I'll ask the clerk to call the roll. Um yes. Councilor Freeman Dan. Aye. Council Labar. No. Council No. 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 Yes. Yes. That's a five-four split again. <laughs> uh, the amendment fails. Mm -hmm. uh, Council Murphy. Mm -hmm. I have another question for Mr. Fiden before another motion pops up. <laughs> 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 and I have to speak to that. But um, since you've um, been forced to step outside zoning and learn about marijuana to deal with all of this. Um, and a lot of what we're talking about is sort of the proliferation of this substance outside of the controlled nature of these dispensaries. And has there been, and I think we all have to admit that there's a pretty good freelance market in Northampton right now. I mean, these people that are going to dispensaries, they know this stuff works for them for a reason, okay? They, they probably are, you know, shopping wherever they shop now, and they can go to the controlled environment of a dispensary. Has there been any estimate what the impact of a dispensary in Northampton will make to the freelance market? Maybe we'll call it the freelance market. Um, at all in any of the in, in any of the studies in any of the communities that are doing this, how much does it cut down on the business in Pulaski Park once people have a legal avenue yeah. to go to? It's an excellent question. <clears throat> I unfortunately don't know the answer. 
Um, and, and again, my concern to that is, is that we're talking about recreational drug use versus medicinal mm -hmm. drug use. There is a distinction. Mm -hmm. We already have, we do have systems in place, mm -hmm. uh, medical dispensaries that, right. mm -hmm. and the abuse of prescription drugs is high. Mm -hmm. Is it high because of its access through uh, pharmacies? Probably. But, but I think Council Murphy's absolutely right. There is some number of people who have legitimate uses, medical uses, who are buying it illegally now because it's not available. I don't know the answer of what that is, but there's but certainly Theoretically, something. once a dispensary opens and they have a legal way to, and they need it and they're <laughs> prescribed, it's going to reduce the demand in the general illegal market because they now have a place to go to. But what we're talking about really is the illegal market. We talk about distances from this and distances from that. And I know when the high school's in session, the pungent owner of marijuana is still going to emanate from Child's Park, no matter where the hell the dispensary is. It's been, I was there 40 years ago, it's still there today. You know, no matter what the coalition says, it still happens uh, under the trees in, in Child's Park. So to some extent, I mean, we're, you know, what we're talking about is not the dispensary business, we're talking about the general market business. And I'm assuming that's going to go down somewhat if some of the users now have a legitimate way to purchase their product. So it may actually have a positive effect on this street effect when we channel these folks into a legal medium. Um, Councilor Carney, then a positive is a Well, I'd idea. just like to reintroduce the, um, the amendment, the amendment um, keeping it at 200 feet, but deleting the reference to college and university, adding the semicolon and the no, uh, previously mentioned language. Second. So, so you okay? The the, the amendment. Everything it was except except two hundred instead of fifty. A semicolon too. Call the question. Can we call the question on the yeah. amendment? Casey, on on the, uh, the amendment. Exactly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and I and just an observation. I cannot believe we have had this much discussion about pot in our gallery. It's almost <laughs> empty. We don't do it to the gallery. We don't speak to the gallery. We, sp we, we make law. And that's what we're trying to do now. Uh, uh, I'd Council like to Spectre. call the question since we had a lengthy discussion about the same. Uh, about the same called. Any, and all those in favor of calling the question? Aye. 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 Okay. Roll call, please, Mary. <coughs> we're voting on the amendment that, still, that allows the 200 foot buffer but eliminates oh. colleges and universities from the criteria of, of uh, and, buffers. And any policy. other yeah. any other buffer requirements? Yeah. Hi. Yes. 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 All right. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to have a Jeez. <laughs> that is the only amendment yeah. that has survived. <laughs> college and university. Yes. Yes. And an or before high school. And an or before high school. In certain. Oh. All right. Back to the main question. It's a lot of minutes per word, isn't it? I think we have more. Any more? No, no. This? No, we haven't done the main There question. was an arm yeah. yeah. Right. 11.6 B2, first paragraph of B2. Yeah. Is what's, what's, is what's out of this question right now. Yeah, just that. Just, just that. This, yeah, just show it. Okay. Councilor Adams. Um. A, hours of operation, 8 to 8. I'm I sorry, think where? Where are you? Uh, hours of operation. Where is it? Um, it's Which the is? final paragraph of the whole. 4A. 4A. A. Thank you. 4A. I'm moving to strike this. And the reason why is because I don't think it's fair. If your medicine is, for example, a prescribed opiate or, pre or prescribed uh, amphetamine, both of which are arguably more dangerous than marijuana, you can go to 24-hour pharmacies and you can get your medicine. Why then, if your medicine is marijuana, should you have to go between the hours of eight and eight? People from marijuana suffer from very debilitating diseases, just as people who suffer from other diseases who can go to pharmacies 
that are open 24 hours. Thank you. Second. Okay, the motion's been made and seconded now. The amendment. But can I ask a question, though? It's, yeah. Is this the case, Director Fiden, is it the case that if the council is silent on hours of operation that state laws? Uh, I, that's what I'm looking up right now. I, I can't answer remember that. that but I want to check <coughs> the, Councilor the, Adams. The regulations say, state that, that be um, the municipalities can impose reasonable restrictions on time. But there are no, there are no standards no, that the state has. As, as a friendly amendment, uh, could we actually say shall be unlimited rather than Certainly. saying shall be limited from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m.? Certainly. There's an important distinction I want to stress here. So generally, the zoning is silent as to hours, and those are reasonable conditions the planning board can impose. So if you just strike this, it gets rid of all the requirements. So the same thing goes for CVS. The planning board does sign and impose hours restrictions when things are close to neighborhoods. So did we see that there is a state, is there any state recommendation? It's not as far as it sounds like you don't. Okay. Do you know no. okay. I think okay. we should just strike. Hang on, everyone stay in order, please. Um, Councilor Carney, you were done with your question? Well, I offered a friendly amendment with the understanding that there may be a state, um, a state guidance on this, but hearing from the director that there is none, um, I can withdraw that friendly, friendly. Um, friendly amendment to the amendment. Council Spector. Do we, uh, Wayne, do we currently have any uh, hours set for CVS on Main Street or at other places, or are they just, no. they're free to do whatever? Okay. Typically, the only time we, the planning board sets hours are uses in residential neighborhoods, like funeral parlors, where they might affect it. In commercial districts, mm -hmm. as far as I know, this, the hours about some of them about lights. Lights have to turn off at midnight. Um, so, so if I wanted to have a 12 midnight funeral, I have to cancel those plans. Is that correct? <laughs> okay, thank you. Councilor If the ordinance is silent on uh, hours of operation, the planning board can still set uh, rules regarding light and so on in the site plan approval. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Can I follow up on that question? Sorry, it's a follow up um, to sure. the Councilor Murphy's been waiting. Does that then mean that they can then set hours? Yes. Okay, thank you. Councilor Murphy. Oh. But all of our good intentions, the licensee could decide, I'm going to be open from 10 to 5. Case closed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Councilor Adams? Also, if I, oh, um. well, I, I guess that, that confuses me um, because I think what you're saying then is absent uh, any reference to unlimited hours, then the planning board could impose hours of operation. And I'm concerned true for with that. All the uses. So we, we, that, that's standard generally. The burden is really to prove why they do it. So they, don't do, they don't do it willy nilly. It doesn't ha come up very often. It comes up most often for home occupations and most often for lights and parking lots that face uh, residential properties. So uh, they, and what was the reasoning for putting in the 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. initially? Um, to, because typically, it would basically provide some safety for neighborhoods, for neighborhoods to give some assurance that they, you wouldn't have a position where the planning board would allow later hours. I'm sorry, safety? So, to, absent that language. No, I'm, I'm, I'm asking why was the language inserted? So there'd be some assurance for neighborhoods that if you live near a medical marijuana place, it would only be limited from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Oh. They wouldn't worry about it being lower later on. And they could, and they could again impose that. They could impose. They could impose that absent there being a reference in the legislation that says that the hour shall be unlimited. I, I would change distribution, that. deliver, and delivery. Yeah. Um, Mary has a question that it, does it, the language delivery, which is also included in this paragraph, have. Um, have an effect on that was requested by the director of public health from Hampton. She was concerned about um, people delivering marijuana either from a, a growing facility to a dispensary or from a dispensary to a home, and so we added it on her recommendation. And the reason for her concern? I, um, I think sending a message. I, I, I hate speaking for her, but I believe just sort of the more peer, the more activity it is, the more it seems weird. Are, you know, are we really having marijuana vans driving around at two at night? <clears throat> All right. Well, the, right now it's Councilor Adams and Councilor Freeman Daniels, then Councilor Murphy, then Councilor Labard. So, Councilor Adams. Just briefly, my point is that uh, I think that 
my amendments justified even more by the fact that other um, that other limitations on hours of operation can be imposed. So there's really no need for us to do it, and the, and a dispensary could willingly do it themselves. Uh, Councilor Freeman Dane. Yeah, thank you. Um, I uh, I support this amendment, um, and I uh, I do think that we should um, limit the. Uh, I think we should simply strike 4A uh, and not replace it with any uh, further uh, law um, because of the um, oversight the and the and the much more um, thorough. Uh, site plan approval process that takes place may find that uh, um, for reasons having nothing to do with marijuana a 24-hour bill a 24-hour um, uh, business may be detrimental to a neighborhood um, and so I think that uh, the planning board would have uh, would have good um, could have good reasons for restricting hours of operation uh, for, for reasons, again, having nothing to do with marijuana um, or, or these particular facilities or, um, or, or, uh, or businesses. So uh, I support striking this, but, um, but, but going no further than that and, and understanding that there is a possibility that uh, th th hours might be limited uh, due to uh, site plan approval. Thank you. Just a point of information. Of You're saying a friendly amendment nope. to strike the no, but you're no, saying we should strike. Oh, it is. It's already I think the amendment is to strike 4A. Right. It is to I strike, sorry. Strike and, it's I support. and I will support that. Councilor Murphy? Mm -hmm. Well, I think deliveries are important. I mean, it, you know, a guy in brown shorts isn't going to be showing up with a box and walking in the front door. <laughs> it's that they're getting delivered 500 pounds of a controlled substance. Somebody's going to take some interest in that. It's going to have some level of security. You know, I, I'm sure. The police department might kind of like to know when when the shipping and receiving is going to be running, and that there's some security interest there. You know, certainly you might like to have deliveries during regular business hours or something of that nature. Um, deliveries is an important, I think, an important thing to me. Customers is one thing, but large quantities coming and going off a loading dock or however it, it gets done would seem to me to to be a sensitive time in the operation of one of these facilities that would probably want to have more security than when it's locked down and running the way it normally does. Um, Councilor Barge, did you have a question on this? Okay, yes. so a uh, question. And it's on the folders again. Wayne, could you just please uh, explain? Counselor, oh, I'm sorry, we'll get to that. Uh, that we're actually speaking on the amendment so that uh, is not included in the orders at this point. So we'll get to that. We're getting there. It's a slow slog. The sausage, as Councilor Tacey refers to, is laboriously being made. Councilor Adams, you wanted to amplify on your point, and then if there's no limitation on deliveries of other substances like opiates and amphetamines, there should be no limit on deliveries on this substance. When the voters voted um, to pass the decriminalization law, the voters decided that an, a small amount of marijuana under an ounce would be a civil infraction. If you have a small amount of, of um, if you have one amphetamine pill and you have no prescription, or if you have one opiate pill and you have no prescription, they're misdemeanor crimes. So those are treated uh, more seriously mm -hmm. than marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, and in that way, in a sense, they're even more illegal. I think it's more of a, of a, of a stigma to have a, a misdemeanor charge than to have a, a, a fine that you're issued. So when it comes to marijuana as medicine, there's no reason to treat it differently than medicines that are found in pharmacies, mm -hmm. which are often highly more addictive and highly more dangerous and highly more detrimental and actually kill people when misused. So again, I, I, respect, I respectfully disagree with putting any limitation on delivery. It makes no sense. This is, not for rec this is not for recreational use. Let's get past that. This is now medicine we're talking about. Thank you. Councilor Tacey, you had your hand up. Oh, and actually, I'm sorry, Councilor Freeman Daniels did have his hand up and waiting. Then Councilor Tacey, Anyone else on the side? And other than that, Councilor LaBarge. Okay. I, uh, I, I'm, um, I feel strongly about both. Uh, I don't disagree with uh, Councilor Murphy about how delivery um, might be a sensitive topic and an and and important time to, uh, to be on extra alert. But um, I, I don't think that it's, that necessarily means eight and eight. Um, it might be possible to uh, make an arrangement that um, is earlier or later. Uh, or based on um, 
the vagaries of shipment to uh, be varied. Um, I don't think it's, it would be difficult to coordinate with the police if that was necessary. And uh, I think it's, I think by removing this restriction, we let the business manage their own inventory. Uh, and I think we should, we should allow that uh, to happen. So again, I still support this. Councilor Tacey. I was in, I touched on that before about the inventory, the amount of the inventory they would keep in security and things such as that in delivery. I didn't try not to bring it up, but I know that some of these pharmacies, when they have opiates and things delivered, they come in sometimes with a woman with an old bag. <laughs> and uh, so not to arouse suspicion, I've seen that too. Um, it's tactics have been used everywhere. So anyway, I don't know. I, I'm going to have to agree with the delivery, I think, is uh, should be some kind of controlled somehow, or at least uh, at least notify the police or uh, something. Just a I'll point of order. I'll let it go. I, I just don't understand how this relates to the... Uh, is that actually a, an expression against the amendment? I'm not sure how that... It's, or is it a change? I'm saying wording? unlimited or? hours of operation. Oh, okay. Unlimited hours of deliveries. I understand. So it's, was, it's, what, what my point was, too, that somebody said deliveries weren't all that relevant, and to me they are because okay. this substance tends to have more bulk and therefore... Got it. Um, Councilor Barsi, do you have a question? Uh, Councilor Freeman. Quite just an interrogative. Um, I wonder if, the, if uh, Councilor Murphy would agree that um, the planning board through the site plan approval might might set delivery hours more appropriately than we can using this blanket language. The questions directly to you, you're, you're welcome to answer. <laughs> or not. You don't, have to, <laughs> you don't have to. Things that are in ordinances tend to happen that way. No, the planning board. I love them, but sometimes I agree with them, and sometimes I don't. If it's in an ordinance, it stays that way. <laughs> Until we change it. Or Until it's we temporarily suspended. Mm -hmm. Call the question. The questions, all those in favor of calling the question? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Roll call, please, Mary. We're voting Hours. on the amendment to strike. Hours. Hours in, of it's entirety <clears throat> 4A which reads, hours of operation for any sale to the public and distribution and delivery of marijuana shall be limited from uh, limited to 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Motion is to strike. Yes. No. Yes. No. Yes. 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 Aye. He said, said I. He yes. said I. He's a pirate. He said mm, no. <laughs> you really do want to put those guys in Pulaski Park out of business. I guess. <laughs> right. the, motion, the motion carries. The amendment stands. <clears throat> so that is struck. Back to the question. Any further discussion on the question? Councilor Freeman Daniels. I have no further amendments to offer. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Lebron. Thank Mary, Mary thanks you. <laughs> He's still wrecking that. He's okay. I just want an explanation, please, about the odors from marijuana. I mean, if it's being delivered, it's not a factory. I'm just concerned because of all the difficulties I had on my ward with odors. <laughs> <laughs> what is this <clears throat> all about? This is an abundance of caution. I, I believe the state regulations, state regulations are regulated anyway. But remember, marijuana, you're not allowed to subcontract your workout so if for example instead of selling this as a broken up leaf you're selling it in brownies you might be cooking it or if you're selling it as lollipops so there could be processing smells um mm -hmm. so this would be from a dispensary but if you're making this as well so we allow not only dispensaries but we allow uh, growing facilities and treatment facilities and so we're just saying we don't think it's going to happen but we want to make sure you have a proper filtering so that our building inspector could enforce if there were odors they were getting after this school. Okay. Thank you. That's all I wanted to know if it was state regulation here or what. Thank I, you. I should point out there are some businesses who have mock fragrances that smell much like marijuana that intentionally broadcast it onto the streets. And they with with I would I would presume 
not the noblest of reasons. So. <laughs> um, any other questions? It's, uh, it's called a question. The question's being called. This is on the over. Yeah. All right. Actually, can I say yeah. one thing? Sure. Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, can we, uh, can we just have for the public's benefit, um, and to say it on the record, why we're being asked to vote on two readings for this tonight? So. Right. Yes, go right ahead, please. Um, so, because the state licenses are due uh, uh, before you'd have a chance for second the application for the next license, applicants would like to be able to say yes in, in part of their application to the state. Yes, we're in conformance with local regulations. Because the next stage of the application is they have to be site specific. They have to say I'm applying. Before it was I'm applying for dispensary in Hampshire County. They have to say now I'm applying for dispensary in Northampton at X address. And they'd like to be able to say, and that site complies with Northampton zoning. And we don't really know what Northampton zoning is as of today. If you pass this, then they can provide <coughs> insurance for the permits. Mm -hmm. On first reading, I'm going to ask to call the question. The, the, call this the is question. a calling the, the yeah. question's being called. All those in favor of calling the question, please say aye. Oh, boy. Aye. Yes. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Roll call, please. Way back. Way back. Well, uh, Way Council back. Freeman Daniels was the original motion to, and I'm trying to remember the second. No, I also I think, I think I made the motion in the second part, but I'll make it again. Oh, you can't. We've already had discussions. I, I know that it we had. It was made and seconded. Wait, before we started. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it was Councilor Freeman Councilor Daniels. Freeman and Daniels. Councilor Adams. And Councilor Adams. That does make Sounds sense. Good. So if you could indicate <laughs> the posterity, it was Councilor Adams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When people start speaking of our forefathers, blah, 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 <laughs> we don't know exactly who to refer to in the 200 years from now. Councilor Murphy. Oh, Murphy. Well, Murphy. In the record book. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so roll call, please. We're now voting on the body of the question with the exception of one paragraph that's toward that. Uh, okay. And the, and the deletion of the yeah. hours and of the, the, as, as amended. amended. As amended. Murphy? Yes. 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 Aye. Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Um, I want to do the second reading. I move second reading. Uh, there's a, a, do you want to, I need a second motion to suspend rules? Suspend rule for Second. second. Aye. All those in favor of suspending rules, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Second, second reading. reading. Second. Second reading is moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Councilor Freeman Dan. Yeah, I, um, I just want to say that uh, I'm not entirely comfortable with um, passing ordinance, uh, zoning ordinance, especially on two readings on one night. Um, but uh, given that we had a lot of discussion and much of the opposition had a ample opportunity to ring in during subcommittee meetings. Um, I think we can go ahead with this, but I, I wish that it weren't a regular practice. I no. agree. Okay. So, any other discussion on second reading? Roll call. Please. Oh, Councilor Tacey. Yeah. For what it's worth, I'll vote no on the second reading because I think there might be somebody in the public that might like to weigh in on this in Noted. between now and the time that the next meeting. Noted. Uh, roll call, please. Yes. 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 No. Yes. 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 Hi. Yes. Yes. Okay. Request a five-minute recess. Five-minute recess has been requested. Uh, we will have five-minute recess. We'll reconvene in five minutes or so. Let's not make the order.
Thank you very much. We're back. We're coming out of uh, recess, and we're back to the business at hand. 11B2, for those of you who have been following, at home, following along at home, 11B2, I'll accept the motion to put it on the floor. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, Councilor Freeman, Dan, would you, want, would you discuss why you wanted to separate it? Aye. Yeah. Um, I see this as a separate, uh, a separate um, bit of zoning to the uh, marijuana ordinance. Um, I see this as a looks as, looks to me as though it's a technical fix that uh, the, that planning board is trying to and office OPD is trying to uh, uh, put into the uh, approval criteria using for traffic mitigation. Um, so I'm not I'm not opposed to it, but uh, I am I, I am opposed to uh, two votes tonight. Uh, this is regular zoning. This is not related, to, from what I can tell, to um, medical marijuana facilities per se. And um, and I also have a, a problem uh, that I'd like to uh, address between this, just a slight problem with the, how this process happened between this meeting and the next. So uh, I'm not against it. I just think that the council should do the normal procedure. One vote today, one vote on November 21st. Could could we recognize uh, Wayne Feiden on this? Right. Just to ask his question. Wayne's, could, Wayne is trapped in we, recognition. At right. this point. <laughs> so first of all, uh, having a reading today and next one in the next meeting is just fine. There's no just reason not to do that. So um, this comes, uh, Council's right, this comes from a totally different uh, source. This came from a U.S. Supreme Court decision. Um, there's a link together when we took the medical marijuana language to Alan Sewell, the city solicitor. He was uncomfortable with us moving forward without addressing this potential deficiency from the Supreme Court case. That's why it's together, but the two weeks delay won't, won't be an issue. So let me just give you some background for context and then talk about this change. So um, we, we keep calling this traffic mitigation, but as Council Murphy said, we don't require cash. We would actually prefer a developer make improvements. So many developers make improvements. Opal at Round Hill is making improvements. They're not giving us a penny of cash. Many developers make improvements. We give developers a choice um, to say you could voluntarily pay into this fund in lieu of making your own bricks and mortar improvements. And so some projects, it's difficult for them to make the improvements. And so they give us the cash for us to make them. And some projects are worried about liabilities, so they don't want to do it. So the, the, the development community is split. About half the time they make improvements. Um, Hill and Dahl Mall is adding a signal, or a pedestrian phase, the signal on King Street. It's their improvements. They won't give us cash. Um, uh, Walgreens gave us a bike path, which is worth about $90,000 and about $60,000 of cash. So we get a mix of those things. So the rules for, for last six or seven years we've had this, have been if you're proposing a project, first you look at what traffic mitigation you provide. If you don't want to do that, we have a formula that says here's the dollar amount you can give us. Um, the Supreme Court was saying we need to have a clear, individualized, fact-based assessment on how much the mitigation for this project is worth. So, you know, is this project going to create $50,000 of damages or $100,000 of damages? Um, and so starting as of you know, two months ago when the Supreme Court ruled, if anything's come up, we will, we will be doing a fact-based assessment for doing it. As a practical matter, it's probably not going to make any difference because in the past we gave a formula. We said, here's the dollar amount. Now we say that's a cap. We can't charge more than that. And that's to provide the development community with some assurance. Planning board's not going to do an assessment and say, oh, it's $10 million. So the numbers are there to give them assurance. Because you can ask <clears throat> developers, if you're buying a piece of property to make an offer on the land, you'd like to know what's the worst case assessment. So giving them that worst case is important. We still have to do a fact-based assessment. As a practical matter, our fees are low enough that I would believe in most cases the minimum is also going to be the maximum. That we're doing assessment, we find that their impacts are more. But we're each time we do differently. We look at that. We just I just wrote Pioneer Valley Planning Commission today to see if we can give us any help thinking about that methodology. We have to think about exactly how do we do this, because one of the reasons the development community actually liked the formula is under the old system before City Council changed the rules, we required a traffic study for every project to figure out what the dollar amount was. The problem for a developer is 
you're paying five or 10,000 for a traffic study, and then you're giving us the dollar amount. So developers actually like the formula, but the Supreme Court said we can't do it that way. So we're being, this brings us into compliance with the Supreme Court. The reason the time is not, so it's critical we do this, but the reason the time isn't critical is as a practical matter, if somebody applies tomorrow, we will do a fact-based assessment and we can't charge them, because the Supreme Court has told us that, we can't charge them more than the impacts are. We just like to correct the zoning so it's truth in advertising. And it also would not have an, an effect impact one way or the other as far as DPH is concerned in their review of licensure. Any other questions? My Council. only request is I probably won't be here two weeks from tonight. So if there's questions you have between now and then, okay. let me know. All right. It's starting to look like no one's going to be here. I'm just going to be worried. <laughs> uh, Councilor Freeman Daniel. Uh, the only other thing I want to make sure is taken care of before uh, November 21st is that the code is, is updated. Um, it's just a technical matter, but uh, the, the council passed um, an amendment to this code in Dece on December 20th, 2012, and um, that wa was not included in this, uh, this new package and um, went through planning board and uh, ordinance, and it, it was... Um, it omitted a sentence that the that the council added uh, almost a year ago, so um, I don't know if that uh, matters. But uh, well, it doesn't <laughs> matter if, if we're making law; we better make the right law. So. Right. So, uh, assuming that uh, we can, assuming that the council understands that this that what they read here on this page is actually not the law, that it's one sentence short of the law, then uh, I think we're all, all right. Then. Um, do you have that sentence handy? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> I was particularly proud of it since I, I proposed it, and it actually passed. And that was that. Yeah, I can understand you're interested in seeing it through. That yeah, it was that all in lieu of payment. You might remember this from last year. All in lieu of payments will be expended with the approval of the mayor and city council only after first being introduced for recommendation to the Transportation Parking Commission, consistent with planning board conditions. And then there's the sentence that's being struck which is the generally very large master plan project. So that, that sentence wasn't included in, the, um, in this change to be amended. I, think, I don't think through anyone's fault. I think it just got omitted by the, uh, by the, when the updates were, were happening or something like if, that. If, if you would be so kind as to forward that to the, um, the secretary so that that, uh, that can be included for the second reading. That's fine. Uh, presuming mm -hmm. the second reading will come uh, in the next council meeting. It, it makes sense to have from a, a truth and advertising standpoint because the language clearly says the only change we're making is what the, what the addition is. I don't think it has a legal effect on this, but in terms of it all being one place, it's a good idea. to Right. Mm -hmm. Noted. Any other questions? No other questions. Uh, roll call, please. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Hyde? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniel? Aye. Councilor Hyde? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you all before cast we, your mind back. I, <clears throat> before, before we move on, um, I'm sensitive to Councilor Freeman Daniel's concerns, but given the body count at our next meeting, um, we we will we still need a supermajority, and if one of the remaining councilors should step in front of a bus, <coughs> oh, thanks, <laughs> we're going to be short. Uh, well, if if it, <laughs> that's the case, then we would postpone the vote. Yeah, we could. Okay. Yeah. Just it I, seem like there's a rush on the. And here's hoping no councilors get hit by a bus. Oh, it's not my desire that that happen. But, yeah, sniffle or yeah, something sniffle. along that line. <laughs> I would hope you would get. Let's move along here. Okay, so you all, you guys all remember, like I don't know, it was like hours ago. I read a resolution relative to uh, this issue. Do you want me to read it again? Please dispense with the reading. The, the reading is dispensed. Is I'll accept the motion to put it back on the floor. I move second. Just for folks at home, this is the resolution uh, from the mayor and myself. Um, uh, essentially expressing the fact that we as a community are amenable and prepared to accept 
the establishment of medical marijuana dispensaries here in the city of Northampton. Any discussion? Oh, come on. We need, come on, everyone's getting. Call the question, we please. We've got a lot of ways come to on. go here. Everyone's going to look a lot peppier. Come on. <laughs> it's, all right. Council Freeman Daniels. Under the um, uh, paragraph one, two. Under paragraph seven. Two, three. We did strike hours of operation from the ordinance. Um, Do you want to amend that? No, actually, I don't. I'm just calling it to everyone's attention. Um, this is for site plan. So the planning board can still set some hours of operation under site plan. So this is still acceptable, uh, even though we, uh, the council eliminated hours of operation requirements. And uh, I support this as written. Good point. OK. Any other questions on the resolution? Uh, there is a request for two readings for the reasons that were stated before. This will need to be included in the application packages. I think it's the 17th or the 21st is when it's due. So. All those in favor of the resolution, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Any abstentions? The resolution passes. Yeah. I'll accept the suspension of rules. So moved. Suspend, suspend two readings rule. Motion to made to suspend rules. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'll accept the motion to put on the floor a second time. So moved. To approve. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Lockdown, ready to go. It will be available to the applicants to forward in their application in a timely fashion. So thank you all very much. Uh, now, how about those minutes? So moved. <laughs> Approval of minutes on the wait, wait, 13th. Wait, wait, let me, we got to uh, let October. Yeah. Okay, let, let, let Mary catch up here. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think anyone made that motion. Yeah, somebody did. Uh, my bad. Yeah. Somebody did. So who made the second? Who motioned it the second time? I second. So these two? Can we just do that? Um, who who, mo who made the motion? I mean, it was I did either the motion or the second on both. Councilor Spector made the motion. Council LaBarge seconded it. All right. We can go back and watch the second <laughs> privilege. It's a, uh, um, okay, now we're back to the minutes. I'll accept the motion. Uh, the motion's been made. Move to approve. Any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? Minutes have passed. Where are we? Reports of committees. Reports of committees. There's, um, the minutes from SSVA, I mean, Social Services and Veterans Affairs minutes, the, also the Public Safety minutes of October 7th, 2013. The Committee uh, on Rules, Ordinances, and Orders minutes of S October 7th, 2013. Can we take those as a group? Second. Mutual. Okay. So they've been moved as a group. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> okay. Now we're up to a new appointment to the Planning Board of Dan Felton. So moved. Second. Recommend. Recommend. Move recommend. To recommend. No, move to refer. To recommend to uh, recommend yes. to the uh, committee on appointments. No, no, he he already gets yeah, recommend it already not came to refer. To us. Yes. All right, <clears throat> this is upon the recommendation of that committee. Okay, on the recommendation, just on Dan Felton. So the motion is to to approve Dan Felton. Yes, and there is a second. Did you did yes. you interview this? Yes. So we met with Dan Felton on Monday. We interviewed him. You can he, he's a great candidate. He was actually a very important person on the stormwater task force and showed uh, both a skill in terms of facilitation and, and quite a bit of knowledge and a willingness to research issues and to work really hard. I think this is going to be a, he's, is, it's just an associate member right now. Um, I think he's going to be a great addition to the planning board. We did interview him um, and we unanimously voted for his uh, positive recommendation to the whole council. I just have a question. Is his name spelled correctly here on this? Um, Felton. T E N? Yes, it is. Okay. Good job, Mary. L T E N. All right. Any further questions, discussion on this appointment? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you very much. 
Uh, then we have, let's say, hey, look, it's, up, it's time for finance. Um, we'll <coughs> go into recess and convene in finance committee chaired by Councillor David Moon. Here. Here. Present. Here. Excellent. And our first order of business tonight is the tax rate, which we tried to do earlier, but needs to come out of finance first. Um, so, upon the recommendation of Mayor David Narkowitz, order that the Northampton City Council approves for fiscal year 2014 a residential factor of one. Move to recommend. Second. Second. Okay. We talked about this at length. Any more discussion here? All in favor of a Aye. positive recommendation? Aye. Aye. Okay. No, none opposed? Good. Number one. <clears throat> now, the, this next issue gets a little bit confusing, and the mayor's going to talk to about this, but essentially what we're doing is rescinding a TIF and giving a grant directly from CPC. So before I read this, it probably makes more sense to have the mayor give us an overall description of what's going on here so that no one gets confused. Is everyone all right with that? I think everyone's already confused, so it's right. fine. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> so this uh, concerns the uh, sort of the two-pronged uh, award that, that uh, the, the council voted um, in support of the Christopher Heights assisted living facility at Village Hill. Um, and at the request of the project developer, uh, we sort of put forward a somewhat unorthodox uh, approach, which was to combine um, a $120,000 grant from the CPC of CPA funds that came to the city um, to offset a TIF, uh, which the city council, a tax increment financing um, agreement, which the city council also voted on. Um, and I know that this, um, ironically, uh, this was a very um, confusing uh, and unorthodox and at nearly every committee level, um, folks said, well, you know, why not just give the money directly to the project developer? Um, but again, the, the developer, this is the preferred route that they had requested, so we were trying to accommodate him. So fast forward, uh, they're going through their process for um, low-income uh, tax credits for the project, and now the um, uh, Mass Department of Housing and Community Development has flagged this as an issue, and they uh, would prefer that um, instead of this arrangement, that the grant go directly <coughs> to the project. So the um, Community Preservation Committee, I brought it back to them, uh, they've agreed to essentially rescind their previous order and have put forward now to you just a clean award of $120,000 directly to the Grantham Group. Again, to remind you, half of the units at this project are affordable um, uh, uh, assisted living. So that's the rationale why these qualify for, uh, for CPA funding. Um, and so the TIF goes away. That piece of it we will not proceed with because the TIF was dependent on um, the award of the funding uh, to the city. So that piece doesn't require a revote, but we need a, a revote of the CPA award. Um, so that's why these two orders are before you one to rescind what you did before, and then a second one to kind of. Uh, to put forward a new order, um, same hundred and twenty thousand dollars, not a different hundred and twenty, but the same, just a different uh, wording. Okay. So has everybody got that? So now I'll read them. Just if, if I read the, I was afraid if I read the order, it would be a little too confusing. So upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, order that the order passed on March seventh is hereby rescinded, and the order was that whereas the City of Northampton and the Grantham Group submit an application for Community Pres Preservation Act funding for the Christopher Heights Affordable Assisted Living Project, and whereas the project will provide 43 units of affordable assisted living 
in a new 83-unit assisted living residence at Village Hill with affordability restrictions to be held by the City of Northampton and the Department of Housing and Community Development. And whereas affordable assisted living is a housing type that is in demand locally and regionally, and whereas the master plan for redevelopment of the former state hospital includes assisted living, and whereas the Grantham Group has an excellent record of creating affordable assisted living in Massachusetts, and whereas on January 2nd, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted five to one to recommend 120,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support the project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that 120,000 be appropriated from Community Preservation Act funding to the city of Northampton for the Christopher Heights Assisted Living Affordable Project for creation of 43 uh, affordable housing units and that the grantee meet the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the mayor, the city council, and the CPC funds will be used to capitalize a portion of a 15-year TIF uh, abatement project for the project. Uh, specifically, the 120 is appropriated from the affordable housing reserve account. So we're going. That's we're rescinding that one. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and <clears throat> so does it makes sense to mention what we're replacing it with. It's well, essentially after now, therefore. Yeah. Yeah. Be it ordered. Yeah. Yeah. So. So, so can we? For, uh, get a motion to recommend. I'll make oh. a motion to recommend. And a second. Yes, second. Okay. Then what I'll do when we once we voted on this one, I'll do the new CPC funding them directly. Also, two councilor, I think they're going to be asking for two readings on, on the on the I think on the second one. City council. Yeah. Yes. In city yeah. council. On yes. The city I'll do council. This. Okay. Not not here. So all I in favor of rescinding that. recommending rescinding this one, say aye. 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 No one opposed. Yep, but we're all set. <clears throat> we're good. Okay. Now this is the this is where the money's coming back. Uh, upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee. Actually, I think all the language is the same it's right up to the, the very. Are you want me to just read the very end? Yes. <laughs> okay. Now, therefore, be it word that 120,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Grantham Group for Christopher Heights Assisted Living Affordable Housing Project for creation of 43 affordable assisted living units and that the grantee meets the condition approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and the Council, and the 120 is appropriated from the CPA Affordable Housing Reserve account. Otherwise, it's the same. Move to recommend. Second. Any discussion? Yes. What happened to the TIF? Is that, is, is the city offering? TIF went away. Tiff? No TIF. Gone. Just, they just yeah. get the 120 direct. Before it was the convoluted gauntlet that it had to yeah. go through well, to actually. Yeah. But my recollection, uh, I could be wrong, because I did a lot, but my recollection is that the CPA was only offering a portion of the TIF. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I actually, when I went back to the, to the um, CPA to seek this amended order, um, I did in fact ask them if they would be willing to increase the CPA award. Um, they're not. Um, and, well, they. It wasn't that they weren't. They wanted. Uh, they felt that that change would require coming back in for another application. They didn't want to just amend up the figure. They felt that that needed to be a new application. So basically, the way we had it structured was a hundred. It was a twenty-five percent TIF. A um, hundred and twenty of it represents twenty percent of the twenty-five percent, and then the remaining five percent, which is. Again, we're just using rough numbers. About thirty thousand was the five percent portion. Um, so, the net result of what we're doing is means that we're lowering the city's support for the project um, because we're not giving them any TIF. Um, but so I did ask them if they would be amenable to that, and so we still the project applicant would still go back to them to make a second application. But you're correct, Councilor. So no TIF. That's right. The TIF, TIF was contingent on the award of the CPA money, so going to the city rather than exactly. directly. So yeah. because so, it's okay. So yeah. I will not be moving forward and executing any TIF agreement with them. Thank you. So they got the you. TIF. We got the cash. Yeah. But now, yeah. So well, that no we get the TIF. They, yeah, they no, get the cash. Ignore the, ignore the <laughs> the other way around. The other way around. Now. They get the. All right. Um, yeah, just a question relative to the TIF. In the absence of the TIF, does that change the disposition of their application or intent to proceed? No. Uh, again, I think that um, I think that this was always. I think that their um, at this point their biggest concern is trying to meet the uh, mass uh, 
uh, Department of Housing and Community Development's criteria. So they understand. Okay. So the difficulty they, the, is in all the other communities, this is like their fifth of these Christopher Heights. TIFs had always been sort of part of their, right. their business model. And so this was sort of the way that they had done it. And so I remember that presentation very yeah. well. And, and so we were probably one of the first communities that actually put CPA money into it. Um, and in fact, the one no vote on the CP C committee was that they loved the project. They just they couldn't understand why they wouldn't just take the money, <laughs> put it in the bank, and take out a little bit every well, year. You know, I, exactly. I, so, I recall that <clears throat> exactly. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so Daniel said yeah. something very yeah. similar. Yeah. Right. Exactly. I so I'm actually very gratified by this because it takes the city off the hook over the long term. Right. So I'm very happy. And I suggest that I'm concerned that we didn't. I I didn't want the developers to think we set them up in a bait and switch type. Not of no, not in the least. And believe me. Uh, no, not in the least. Okay. I won't go into it. I just yeah. don't want. I don't want to get a. No, and actually, there's a letter in the record from Mr. Ohanian asking me to do this, okay. requesting that I do this. So we have a letter from him requesting this change. Thank you. That letter didn't get in the packet, did it? Uh, I think it may have gone to the CPC, so it may have been in that application, but maybe it didn't come to you. Yeah. But that was the basis for which they agreed to make the change. But we can get you a copy of it. Um, so I should give this back to Mary. We're we'll going to vote. All in favor of positive Aye. recommendation? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Good. Give the original. Do I steal the other one, too? There you go. So I have to give back the old ones before I get the new ones. That's right. That's the way it works. <laughs> All right. So the next is a budgetary transfer. Upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz, order that the following FY 2014 budgetary transfers hereby be made. Um, the Board of Health <coughs> is getting some permanent salaries, or, or it's going from uh, Board of Health permanent salaries and salary reserve for wage increases to contract inspection services. And um, this is for an arrangement to share the sanitarian with Amherst. I don't know if you want to speak to this one too, but essentially we're, we well, share a sanitarian and this pays what exactly. our share. I'll, I'll move to recommend first and then. Oh, second. second. You may remember recently, I, uh, Meredith, uh, yes. health mm -hmm. director, Meredith O'Leary came before <clears> you because um, we, the previous agreement with Amherst was that um, we shared a nurse and a sanitarian and the, the, the financial arrangement was we paid for the nurse and benefits they paid for the sanitarian and benefits um, Amherst decided to amend that agreement and no longer share a public health nurse so now we're left with just sharing the sanitarian and so um, we're now moving this the, f the portion of those funds to contract services um, because we are now contracting with Amherst essentially for those services the deal before was just two full-time employees you pay for the salary benefits of that one, we'll pay for the salary benefits of that one, and that was how we did it before. But now since we're just sharing one employee, we are actually paying them to part of the salary and benefits. So and didn't they actually steal the nurse? Um, I'm not going to... Uh, You're not going to comment on that one, okay. Hiring, they did end up hiring um, uh, Nurse Adams, who's now going to yeah. become their full-time nurse. Okay. So, yes. <laughs> I've given uh, right. that will go down said, with my bus analogy is in a sufficient uh, heat grief about that so so uh, any more questions about this one all in favor of a positive aye aye, aye. any opposed good and this is upon the recommendation again of D mayor David Narkowitz order that four thousand seven hundred and twenty one dollars and sixty cents the balance remaining from a January third 2013 appropriation for the replacement of pistols for the police department is no longer needed for that purpose and the remaining funds be reprogrammed to supplement the June 27th 2013 appropriation for tactical equipment for the police department move to approve second okay any questions for the mayor on this one pretty straightforward all right oh uh, well Councilor Adams so it's no longer needed for for guns yeah you may have remember you may remember that we um uh, we had a, we put forward a, a couple of different uh, capital improvement projects, and um, uh, initially we were going to actually uh, send all the um, pistols in and have them 
uh, recited and and all sorts of other maintenance work on it. And then it turned out that we were able to actually, for less, we were able to purchase all new um, Glocks. And so it ended up being more cost effective to do that. And so there was actually some excess money now left over from that capital project. Um, and so they are asking if we could <coughs> program that remaining money and move it into this tactical project to give them additional funds to purchase tactical equipment. And, and the, tac the tactical equipment is environmental stuff, as I recall. Mm -hmm. It's hazmat gas mat, it's hazmat stuff. stuff. It's not, yes. you know, they're not buying a tank. It's uh, protective gear that ages out over so many years. And uh, we weren't able to fund all of it. So we replaced, we gave them money to start replacing it. And they just want to take this leftover money and add to that, you know. So it's for gas masks and mm -hmm. protective gear for the officers if they they get into a hazardous situation. And this is, of course, funds that you've already appropriated, yeah. and it's just because we're changing the purpose of how you appropriated them, we have to come back to you and and re get your permission to repurpose it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on this one? All right. All in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Any opposed? <laughs> uh, so we go to fire now. On the recommendation of Mayor David Narkowitz, order that whereas the mayor's FY14 capital plan approved by the city council in June provided the Northampton Fire Department with funding for new fire apparatus, which is scheduled to be delivered in November, very soon. It's a new engine. Whereas the fire department has declared engine five surplus and has competitively bid the disposal of the apparatus and has awarded a bid to the most advantageous uh, bidder, Brindle Mountain Fire Apparatus in Alabama for $45,000. And whereas the funds from the sale of the surplus apparatus are intended to be used to equip the new incoming apparatus, and whereas the new apparatus needs to be put into service before the surplus apparatus is released, and therefore the funds need to be available in advance of the receipts from that sale. And whereas the funds received from the sale of the surplus apparatus will flow automatically into the general fund, and it's the mayor's intent to seek appropriation of that funds back to capital stabilization. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $44,975 be appropriated from capital stabilization for the purposes of equipping the new fire apparatus. Second it. Second. Any questions for the mayor on this one? I think, I think the mayor put his memo into the into the preamble. It sure looks like it. Yeah, I did. I tried to. Uh, I, yeah. So again, the, this is. Um, we had said from the start when you approved this capital project that we were going to <laughs> sell that engine and get and get funding for it. Um, we're just caught in this catch-22 where we need to <coughs> stuff, and you've got a detailed list of all the things we have to buy to outfit the engine, um, but we can't actually um, we can't spend the proceeds of the sale until we sell it, and, and we don't want to sell it till we get the new engine. So um, so we're essentially going to take money out of capital stabilization uh, to, to pay for these upgrades to this project. And then when we do sell it, uh, the money will flow into the general fund and we'll put it back in capital stabilization. Um, it's really just a timing issue. Um, and that's why we, uh, mm -hmm. we need to do this. So and that way we're not down an equipped engine at any point. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Any other questions on this one? All right, then all in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. Any opposed? Great. And if possible, uh, I don't know if we made the request, but I, I would be helpful two for reading. two readings two. because obviously the engine's it's coming. It is, um, it is there. Yeah, oh, excellent. Yeah, the council meeting. Mm -hmm. Good. And uh, I don't believe there's anything else on our agenda, so a motion to adjourn finance. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Vote go back into regular session. Thank you very much, Council Murphy. Um, Oh, look. <laughs> what? You'll remember this. It's upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narcowitz, the Northampton City Council approves for fiscal year 2014 the residential factor of one and the enclosed uh, tax levy. Move to approve. Second it. The motion made and seconded. Any discussion on the floor on this? Um, roll call. A roll call, please. Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councillor Yes. Yes. Councillor Schwartz? 
Yeah. Yep. Yes. Next up is the financial order, the rescission of order passed that we discussed. Um, I'm assuming you are okay with me waiving reading? I move yes, two sir. and three as a group. Okay, I'll accept two. the motion. Move two, 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 two and three. three. Move two and three as a group. <coughs> uh, two, uh, which ones? Yeah. Two and three. Two and three are being three. moved as a package, and that's seconded. Is that... <laughs> I know you're doing two readings on, on this. On both of them. Yeah. yeah. Both of them. Is that the motion? Yeah. yeah. The motion is to First move to both as a package. It's been seconded. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and wave reading of the other half. And wave reading of the other half. Everyone's okay with the orders? Any d further discussion on these two items? Um, this is going to have a roll call. Council Carney? Yes. Council Jordan? Yes. Aye. Yes. 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 I'll accept a motion to suspend rules. Suspend rule for Second. Two. Any discussion on suspension of rules? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Move second reading. Second it. Aye. Second reading. Any further discussion? You ready to do roll call? Okay. <coughs> Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. This is, uh, next up is the FY 2014 Board of Health Budgetary Transfer of $23,313 for rework Amherst Sanitarian uh, <coughs> contract. Oh, so second. moved. Second. Any discussion on this? Okay, and this, yeah, roll call, please. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Stockton? Yes. Councilor Stockton? Yes. Councilor Casey? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Next up is the financial order to reprogram $4,721.60 for the replacement pistols to tactical equipment for the police department. I'll accept it. Second it. Any discussion? Roll call, please, Mary. Council yes. Council Murphy? Yes. 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 Aye. Next up, the financial order, appropriation of $44,975 from the Capital Stabilization Fund for new fire apparatus. Move to approve. Second. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Stockton? Yes. Councilor Casey? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Yes. Suspend Rule 14. Second. All those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. 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 And opposed? Okay. I'll accept a motion for the second reading. Move to approve. Second. All right. Any further discussion? Take it away, Mary. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Stockton? Yes. Councilor Casey? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Daniels? Aye. Councilor Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Yes. Next up, and this is it's a good thing the mayor's here, of course. This is an order to seek special legislation to allow the issuance of an annual all alcoholic hotel license over quota to the Fairfield Inn and Suites on Conn Street. This is the first reading. Do you want to hear all the language to it? No. No? <laughs> <laughs> Should I have been asked? This, <laughs> did, this is an interesting, this is an interesting. So would you like to read it? Yeah. yeah. You want to hear that? It is interesting. Okay. It is an interesting order. Just upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and the Committee on Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use, and ordered that whereas the city of Northampton wishes to continue to encourage the growth and stability of, ho of the hospitality industry in Northampton, and whereas the construction of a new hotel on Conn Street will add to the tax base, create jobs, bring additional revenue to Northampton businesses, and whereas the ability to operate a successful hotel requires the use of an annual all-alcoholic hotel license, and whereas the city of Northampton is over its quota for pouring licenses established in Section 17 of Chapter 138 of Massachusetts General Laws, 
And whereas special legislation is necessary to allow the city of Northampton to issue an over quota annual alcohol, all alcohol hotel license to ensure the economic vitality and stability in the city of Northampton. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the mayor is authorized and directed to seek special legislation as follows. An act authorizing the city of Northampton to issue an above quota annual all alcoholic hotel license. And also be enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives in the General Court assembled and by the authority of the same as follows. Section 1, notwithstanding Section 17 of Chapter 138 of the General Laws, the licensing authority of the City of Northampton may issue one above quota innkeeper license. This license shall be subject to all the provisions of said Chapter 138 except Section 17. The licensing authority shall not approve the change of location of the license. Failure to use and or operate the license for six consecutive months huh, uh, may result in a license commission hearing and the license reverting back to the city for reissuance. See, so, very interesting. Yeah, that was very interesting. So the uh, motion, please. So moved. Second. 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 Okay. Motion to approve. Uh, the motion's been to, made to approve and seconded. <laughs> Your Honor. Yes, I um, went before the Economic Development, Housing, and Land Use Committee a month or two ago um, to seek their uh, support and, and co-sponsorship of this um, resolution. Um, as you know, uh, the owner of the Hotel Northampton, um, uh, Mr. Gabaloff, is uh, now um, undertaking to build a new hotel on Con Street, um, the Fairfield Inn and Suites, uh, which obviously uh, I'm very excited about and pleased about. It's uh, going to be a great project for the city in terms of, again, part of that economic development that we heard about earlier, um, but also providing additional rooms uh, for tourists, as well as not only property tax revenue, but um, additional hotel motel tax revenue. So um, he has requested one of the pieces that he'd like to have um, is the ability to serve alcohol um, at the hotel, as he does at the Hotel Northampton, um, not uh, he's not proposing a large sort of bar or restaurant, but more of a small, a smaller um, uh, uh, bar area for travelers um, who are staying at the hotel. So because we are over quota, um, the route that we must take to uh, seek approval of this is to seek special legislation. Um, you'll see that this is a very specific uh, type of uh, all alcohol license and that it's designated for hotel. We've also put in the, the, another provision that it must stay with the actual hotel itself. Um, uh, so it's not a, a uh, uh, portable license, if you will, um, that can be sold to a different location. It has to stay with the location, um, except if the, as it says in the, um, you know, in the resolution itself, that if the license uh, were to be pulled completely from that location, uh, we wouldn't lose it. We'd be able to still keep it within the city. So, so that's what's before you. And um, I don't have any uh, sense of what whether or not uh, this will pass the legislature. We did send it to the Board of Health for their uh, Board of Health, the License Commission, uh, for their review, um, and uh, and I believe they discussed it. Um, I don't think that they take a vote on these types of things. Uh, and actually. We have the License Commission clerk, so I, I don't know if you'd like to just characterize what their report was. Um, um, the License Commission was asked to discuss it. They do not take a vote so as to not show any prejudice towards any particular applicant. Okay. Um, I have uh, a question about the, it's interesting because uh, many purveyors who do have liquor licenses consider their liquor license an asset for resale. It's 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 valued as an asset. Um, we're, we're, we actually have the means to request that it not serve as an asset, that it can't be transferable um, to to be sold for another enterprise should should that, that close. So we actually have that. Well, this is special legislation, so this is a license that would be created by special legislation. Is it so interestingly, um, I know there have been um, two other licenses in the news uh, huh. that you've been hearing about, perhaps. I'm sure you're right. I don't know. It's um, and, uh, and one of those licenses at issue was actually created by special legislation. Um, and so for that reason, um, if one of those licenses 
uh, were to be taken away from that particular person, one of those licenses would actually stay yeah. within the city. Uh, we wouldn't lose it. Um, the other one would go away. And who, and uh, if that license expires or is removed from the owner, we have the authority to grant it to someone else? It, it's just that it stays within our, I mean, we haven't been in this position for a right. long time because, we, well, because we're over quota. I mean, I have to say just as a, as a baseline here, I don't support the state's laws regarding quotas and, and their quota system. There's, there's not going to get a big fight from the council. It's an antiquated I don't system, it's, uh, and it's, uh, it really makes no sense. I think that it's, I'm fine with them regulating and, and all that, but in terms of telling a community how many um, licenses it wants to issue, I think that's a local decision. So get off my soapbox there. But uh, yeah, so I, I don't know. Um, we haven't been in a position where we've had under we've been under our quota but if someone were to turn in a license say that if they wanted to surrender a license um and it was not over quota we'd have the ability to reissue it to someone else mary correct me if i'm wrong mm -hmm. is that so, correct yeah council freeman daniels uh just a question about um efficacy is it do you believe that uh that final sentence should be in there, or do you think we should give you the authority to drop it? Failure to use and or operate may result in the license commission hearing and license reverting back to the city for reissuance. I mean, would the general court and Senate um, be more likely to give Northampton this uh, license if it weren't to revert back to the city? No, I think that's just a clause, and I think we've used that in all of our special legislation. I think that's just designed so that if some reason, for some reason, the project fell through or the developer, um, let's say he worked on it for many, many years and never actually finished it, I'm just saying this hypothetically, um, uh, that they wouldn't just get to keep it in their um, back pocket, so to speak, uh, to, to use a phrase. Um, I, I, so that's I, sort of what it's about. So I think this is actually kind of boilerplate that we've used in all the other ones that we've had. I don't, I don't think that this will predispose it any differently for the legislature. But okay, you, you, you all done? I, I mean, sure. Oh, Council Murphy. And this is tied to a hotel. Exactly. So you have to be an innkeeper. That's so correct. So this is the sort of thing that yeah, exactly. you can sell to Bob's Bar and Grill. I mean, you got to have a hotel to use this one. that's correct yeah. so we a little be, less portable exactly so it would be um, I mean our hope is that there's going to be a hotel there for a long long time to come mm -hmm. um, it's just that if if um, mr. we don't want mr. Golubov to sell the hotel and take the license with him and leave the next hotelier with no license so that's why we want to stay with the property um, and it also I think distinguishes it for other to other license holders in the community that this is different in some respects than their license for the concerns that you raised about um, people who paid for licenses etc so council tasty then council labarge <clears throat> i still don't want to characterize it as a non-asset it is an asset it's definitely an asset uh, most definitely yeah okay. most definitely council labarge how long does it take mayor State legislation. Uh, you know, I I couldn't begin to. I, I can't tell you. I I don't know. Um, I mean, they'll they're kind of um, in sort of. I wouldn't say a break right now, but they sort of will gear back up again after the first of the year. I mean, they're they're in session, but I I don't know how long it will take for this type of a um, of an active. I mean, obviously we're gonna give it to. Representative Cocott and and give it to um, Senator Rosenberg. I've already talked to them about it, so they know that it's happening. Um, I just don't know. I mean, the charter thing, you know, don't. That They'll was, work on it after the bottle bill. Exactly. Yeah. I, I don't know. Um, I, can, I couldn't tell you. We're obviously gonna. I think that Mr. Golubov would like to have it happen, and and so um, he may do his own independent lobbying for it. But I think that's critical. I I agree with this. It's a business. I think it helps us with the tax base. It also gives people jobs. So I'm hoping that they do move on it. Any further discussion? Um, 
Roll call, please. It's an order. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Tacey? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. And thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, this is a permit required for structures on street sidewalks on public art. This is the first reading. This is upon the recommendation of Councilor Jesse M. Adams, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, <coughs> providing the Code of Ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising Section 285-9 of said code, providing that permit required for structures on streets and sidewalks. Uh, be it ordained by the Council of the City of Northampton, do I have to call for order? She needs to share the joke. She needs to share that joke. Yeah. <laughs> Did we do that to her? By the way, uh, when I finish this, you'll note the time and that we will have to call for extending. Yeah. Uh -oh. so. We'll see how that pans out. <laughs> Be it ordained by the City Council of <laughs> City of Northampton, the City Council assembled as follows a section 285-9 of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts to be amended. So the such section shall read as follows. Uh, permit required for structures and streets and sidewalks. Um, do, you, do you want me to read the whole thing or just the new language? Just the new language. Anything within a sidewalk, street, or on a public building accepting property under the jurisdiction of the school committee that is considered public art by the Arts Council and is reasonably expected to last longer than 90 days shall not be installed without a permit from the Arts Council. Public art may include, but is not limited to, murals, sculptures, and art installations. That's the motion. Is someone put it on the floor? Move to approve. Second. Right. It's your... It's your it's your yeah. ordinance, Councilor. Yeah, yeah. Got, got to hang in. Yeah. We're, we're, we're yeah, hang it. in there. We're going to make it. I'll make this brief. Uh, <laughs> Sheesh. Please uh, vote for it. The, the purpose of this is to, is to um, if, there, if there's art and it's on a public way and it's going to be permanent, unlike chalk art, for example, in the Chalk Art Festival, um, it has to go through the Arts Council so they can get the opportunity to weigh in and give it a permit. <clears throat> um, it's the purpose is to encourage more public art projects and it's to let the Arts Council review, view and give their approval of public art before it's installed. Um, I've spoken with Arts Council Director Brian Foote and I've offered to help them work on a permitting process. This went to um, it did go to the Board of Public, it, if it went to the Arts Council and it got, it got a unanimous vote of support. It also went to the BPW and, and it got to, uh, received a positive recommendation. I don't know what the vote was, but I do know it received a positive recommendation. And now it's before us. That's it. Any other questions, discussion? No. Councilor Freeman Daines. I think this is long overdue. Any other? Um, I've always had a philosophical problem with as to who are the arbiters of what is public art and what is art, and it's always given me pause, and the more we regulate art, the more I think we take, on some level, the artistic nature of it away in some, in some aspect. So it, the, the civil libertarian in me makes me a, a little resistant. I'm amenable to this because I, I, I have also spoken to well, actually, I don't want to say that I'm amenable to it yet, but I have spoken with, with members of the Arts Council about this, and I understand what actually where it came from, and it was generated by concern of the fact to, to mitigate um, essentially commercial management and, and city management of art projects, and it came out of something specifically like that. They, they, my only, as I said, my personal resistance is when we grant authorities, granted to artists, but there, uh, there could be an aesthetic clash that actually I believe could have an inspirational value uh, in a certain installation that someone's prepared to put and that have the Arts Council may have 
depending who's it's made up of, may reject it based on aesthetic values that they have. Um, <coughs> consequently, we will be deprived of that. Um, sure, please. That's more like an open question. So. Well, but when they create their process, they can also create their, their standards, and, and so they're, they're not really judges of, of, um, of, of you know, and they're, they're not there to say, I don't like it. So it doesn't go up, but um, just to create general criteria, that's going to ensure that in it's um it's of a, a <coughs> minimal quality. So um, I think that they it is the arts council, and I think that we can entrust them to to um, make the determination as to what is at least a, a, a at minimum a piece that should be on. Public property. I uh, I understand your um, your philosophical question here. Uh, I think it which like Councillor Murphy cracked me up tremendously when uh, when um, during di during discussion at subcommittee um, the solicitor rang in on this issue and the solicitor said that uh, what would be helpful in this uh, in this ordinance would be to to add the definition of art. Councilor, Councilor Murphy said. That's huge. Councilor Murphy said, "Well, we might as well put in the meaning of life while we're at it." Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, and was, was actually very funny. Just for fun. yeah. uh, so, but but the the issue here, um, first of all, I, I think that uh, practically speaking, although I don't often speak this way, but practically speaking, the Arts Council has not been afraid to uh, make unpopular uh, decisions uh, regarding uh, juried art um, projects, and. Um, and so I, I think that uh, you can you can trust the the judgment of of the arts council over um, the judgment of of, of individuals who uh, who at this point have the ability to install permanent until unless we pass this um, have the ability to install permanent art in the city, which will be viewed for generations or conceivably could be uh, without any scrutiny from any outside, from any art artistic body. Uh, so I think this is a step in the, uh, in the right direction because it uh, creates a process, a public process, a process that's um, conducted by a, a publicly appointed body that holds public meetings uh, instead of allowing the uh, creation and installation of art by, um, essentially by fiat. And uh, I, I think that the Councillor Adams wrote this um, very uh, appropriately to apply to permanent structures, not things that are only going to be there for a short period of time. Um, and that is a, uh, I think it's a key distinction because uh, as a community, we can definitely have very salubrious uh, and interesting conversations around um, disruptive or, or or challenging or or provoking artwork, um, but you don't always want to have it be permanent, and uh, you want to have at least to be at least have some uh, some process, uh, public process associated with the, the public use of space. Okay. Um, Council Just a, a question then. Sure. Uh, These are so. How does this relate to sandwich boards and? Those sorts of um, in, the, in the regulations, we discussed that. In the regulations, they're going to exclude that sort of thing. Hopefully, they haven't written them yet, but we discussed that. And the, the idea is to exclude sandwich boards for another similar things. I'm, I'm thinking of anything else that a, um, a business might put up um, besides sandwich boards that wouldn't necessarily have to. Um, yeah, the scrutiny of the I don't know if I don't think sandwich boards are permanent anyhow, but no, but they could be more than 90 days, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you put yeah, it up in April and just, take it down in November, they, they can just judge it. It's, it's, it's not art. They can say okay. it's not art. It's advertising. That's that's what I'm. That's not. I'm sorry. Who could say it's not art? <coughs> the the way they write up the when way. they create their permitting process, they, they could <coughs> exclude sandwich boards, okay. for example. But the. Okay, but they haven't done that yet. This is yeah. well, they wouldn't until after this is passed, if it's passed. Uh, and I would also have them talk to planning because 
there's art and there's signs, and signs are already regulated. And I know in the past there's been some discussion, is it a sign or is it art? Right, but the content is not really regulated. But this ordinance could prevent that. Yeah. They just want to, when they write their ordinance, they want to figure out what's already defined as a sign so that we keep the art and the signs separate. Um, but one of the things, Councillor Tacey, I think, remember the Go West sign in Florence? There was mm -hmm. an argument, is it a sign <laughs> or is it art? And they decided it was a sign when West was in the building, but once West left the building, it was... It was, it was art. It wasn't a sign anymore because West was gone. <laughs> so just, just to think about that. I, I have to say that um, I am not comforted. Yeah. I'm <laughs> I, and, and, and I think... On one level, I understand that public art done with public monies should subscribe to scrutiny because that, as you said, that's, that's the public allocation of art. Um, we also, we do, we have aesthetic limitations on design, but art is a different thing. Art's remarkably different, and it's different than advertising. It's different than... Um, it's, it's different than the facade of a building. And if it's publicly invested art, fine. I have no, I have no issue with uh, laying down criteria. You could even make it, make sure they're all smiley faces. That's, the, that's, if that's what the public wants. The, what we're protecting people against or from is the manufacturing creation of an artistic piece that may not survive the test of time um, Henry Moore statue of a nude, if it were placed in the grounds of the courthouse a hundred years ago, would have met with great revulsion, and it would have been permanent. And now it would be something that would be considered, make it a personal destination point as the aesthetics and the sense of it changes. And that's the thing that concerns me, and that's why I still I'm still having trouble reconciling. It's just somebody is going to make the decision about permanent structures right. on public spaces. Right. Someone's making those decisions. I can't go out tonight and just decide to put up a permanent structure on the sidewalk. Someone is going to say, Paul, you can do that, and Paul, you can't. Mm -hmm. I think this is a very good amendment because it's the Arts Council then who will make that decision, rather than the mayor all by himself or some other place. I think this is the appropriate place. Somebody's going to make that decision. No, to that point, I, I, and if I can, I would just uh, to the structural integrity and safety, yes. Aesthetic criteria? Somebody, Sorry, but, 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 as a practical matter, if I decide to go out, even if it's safe, somebody is going to say, you can do this or you cannot do this. I would rather it be the Arts Council. Someone, even if it's totally safe. Yeah, the DPW could make decisions about safety, but someone's going to say whether I can or can't do this. And, Somebody's going to do that. So I think this is the best jurisdiction to put that in play. Uh, the other question, uh, I'm assuming this is only pertaining to visual art and only pertaining to structural art, not performance art, yeah, for example. Structural. Not oh, Performance art wouldn't last. In the street. Could it last over 90 days? 90 days. Uh, unless it were, um, I'm just trying to well, anticipate, anticipate. Right in the... Uh, Right. Okay. Uh, Councilor Freeman Day. Uh, I have to disagree with you, with the president, on this uh, on one particular case, um, and I agree wholeheartedly with um, Councilor Specter. Uh, I, I do not see a distinction uh, between public funds and public space. Um, I see. You know, now there's a lot of space that is that we have in the city that we consider to be public, but is actually is actually private. They're private facades, private buildings, and so on and so forth. But the public owns the it's the public owns the public the public space. It's made a, it's made an investment in that public space that that's centuries old. I don't see that funding new art onto public space. Um, I don't see that, that the source of the funds makes any difference for who is going to be in charge of allowing such uh, a, 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 um, a project. 
And I concur, I not only concur, but we have evidence that Councillor Spector is correct, that in fact, it's not just the people who, the, the, the decision making regarding uh, art in the public square is not just whether it's safe, it's to its content, to its, to its construction, to the way it looks, the way it, and, the, and its intended effect in some cases. Uh, so, and, and he is absolutely right. Without this safeguard, it is not subject to a public, uh, to public scrutiny. It's not subject to any oversight. It's, su it's actually subject to, to whim, a and the whim is um, by, uh, non can be done by non-artists. Uh, and, uh, but, but <coughs> I'm repeating what Councillor Spector said, but I don't see a distinction between private and public funding. And, and in fact, uh, we have a, a mechanism in this city that will accept private funding and, um, and, uh, and uh, could conceivably uh, accept private funding and place um, art projects without any oversight whatsoever. Uh, and I see that as actually more detrimental to the public's use of space than um, the public raising of funds. So I think that this is actually very important to protect against that. Be, I, I, know. Yeah. I was going to say, before we proceed, I'm going to ask the council to uh, suspend the rule. Suspend rules for the... the suspend the 11 o'clock. Thank you. It's the 11 o'clock rule. Is there a motion made and seconded? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Any abstentions? Okay. We continue. Uh, Councilor Adams, did you have a point? Also, I just wanted to emphasize, I said it before, but the Arts Council was unanimous, unanimously in favor of this, so they have no anxieties or reservations about, about whether or not it should be within their authority to do this. Any other discussion? Oh, oh just a right question. Um, I just want to have a, a general sense about what, um, I'm assuming this is meant to address a a problem or something that has been seen as a problem and maybe that would be helpful if not just for me for maybe the viewing audience or if there's something some example for example sure the yeah. wayfaring sign that causes the wayfaring sign that most people everyone besides the planning department thought was art um, if this process were in place that could have prevented that if it were on the other side because I believe the side it was on um, actually is in city property. So if that were on the other side, that would be an example of this, that could have been prevented. Um, so it actually is in, in response to that sort of thing. So this, this isn't just a, a solution in search of a problem. There has been problems, and, and that's an example of that. Consultation. <laughs> we had an instance in our ward where a guy had junk in his front yard. He went to, all the neighbors complained. They went to court. And the judge agreed with the guy, he says, to find art. So they went away. The judge found in favor of the guy with the junk in his yard and said it was art. You should see it. It's a, yeah, but that's it's a private that's, space, that's, not a public and space. And even I don't know how that's relevant at all. But, <laughs> but that, that this has to do with um, public art, and there's no definition of art in here. So, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see it. I, I, I share a little bit of the president's concerns about um, just judging what is art and what qualifies as art, even as you just characterized. Thank everyone, you. everyone except the planning board considered that to be art. I mean, I think it can be arbitrary, and certainly there are many pieces of art that um, some, you know, Warhol pieces or many people that would not consider art. I need to respond to that too quick. Yeah. But wouldn't it be Ed, better if the Arts Council made that determination than the Planning Board? Uh, uh, well, I understand what you're saying is that I, I understand, I understand the sentiment, but I'm not sure that either the Planning Board or the Arts Council should determine what art okay. is. But in can I go back to my question? Well, hang, hang on a second. Hang on a second. The, the, that was directed to uh, Councilor Adams. He, he, I, I guess my point is I'm, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I understand that it may be, may seem better on its face that those who are deemed artists would make the decision over those who are not identified as artists, but I, um, I'm a little bit uncomfortable with either of those bodies determining 
table. The value of the argument. I will just go back to somebody is going to make the decision. On a, in public space of a permanent structure, somebody is going to make that decision. Maybe it will be the city council. Maybe it will be the mayor. Maybe it will be the planning board. I think the most appropriate place that we have is the arts council. That is really what we are asking here. We are saying where is the place that this decision should be made? It is not just that anybody at any time can just, if they have the money or the funds or don't need the money, can put a art, whether we like it, don't like it, can just put a structure up that they call art or somebody agrees as art <clears throat> on public property. We are saying someone will make that decision. This is saying we think the Arts Council should be the place to do it. Council Murphy. So if this doesn't pass, perhaps Council Adams should craft an ordinance indicating that no one in the city has art within their jurisdiction. <laughs> <laughs> and we shouldn't put anything up. Yeah. That's it. I, I think that's a specious argument. Um, it, it, but um, I, don't, I don't know as if we swayed any minds one way or the other. So uh, I'd call the question. Is everyone okay with that? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, is there a request to, for a roll call on this? Oh, it is an order. So, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, roll call, please. Councilor Tacey? No. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Uh, no. Councilor Dwight? No. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Labarge? No. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. I believe the motion passes. Five yes. First okay, reading. that's the first reading. Um, damn, where are we at here? Okay. The, um, this, oh, we did medical marijuana. Hey, look how far ahead we jumped. <laughs> um, so <laughs> now we're up to the stop and yield intersections at Prospect, Woodlawn, uh, and Jackson. Um, Move approval. Second. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniel, would you speak to this, please? Uh, the council will recall that um, we initiated a, a temporary traffic uh, order of um, a four way stop at Prospect Woodlawn and Jackson Street. Admit the warrants uh, back over 90 days ago, I think. Actually, it may be fewer than 90 days. Um, the Transportation Parking Commission has been monitoring this. It was. Um, uh, it made the positive recommendation. I think it was unanimous to uh, to to uh, to recommend this as a permanent ordinance uh, for the city. Um, we got a uh, voluminous amount of uh, email, and um, it was almost entirely positive. Uh, the and in fact, the only negative comments had not did not have much to do with the four-way stop itself. Um, so uh, this is um, just making permanent the temporary experiment, which uh, I, th I think mo if you've tried it, I think it, most people agree that it has worked uh, very, very well. Uh, uh, question is that um, with making this permanent, does that diminish the scrutiny of the intersection and possible future mitigation systems that might be employed? Such uh, as a roundabout? Yes, uh, um, not necessarily. Um, however, it has to be noted that um, uh, the, what the warrants for a, for a four-way stop, for example, are based on uh, accident history. So if uh, this dramatically lowers the accident history for a long enough time, it may be the case that it wouldn't <coughs> qualify for additional uh, traffic mitigation. Accident history just increased substantially on election night. <laughs> Just, just for the record, I didn't know that. Did, there was a, 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 a there was a car chase <laughs> oh, really? uh, through the intersection. A car ended up <laughs> nose <laughs> down in on the property on uh, Jackson, on the corner of Jackson Prospect. Well, I think the message then is that uh, from the from the perspective of your question is there's still hope. <laughs> the, the reason I asked was there was consideration of a roundabout at some point. Yeah, there, uh, it's, it's, it's a ways away. Got yeah. it. Okay. Yeah. That's what I need to know. Okay. I'm sorry. Any other discussions on this? Mm -hmm. well, just the, the interest was because winter's coming, you know, to make it permanent, get the barrels out of the way because they're yeah. make it hard to plow. So we want to get going on this so that it can be in place permanently for when the weather gets bad. One other question to that on that point of prospect <clears throat> street, there is um, there is drainage issues on the downslope that goes down prospect to Woodlawn Avenue that ices up in the winter. 
where previously people didn't necessarily have to stop, so it didn't, there, we haven't seen this or experienced this with actually icy conditions. Is, does it make sense to establish a permanent uh, structure knowing that that could possibly be a problem? Do you, uh, I speak yes. to that since it's right at the corner near where I live. Um, you know, a lot of times you needed to stop. You didn't have to stop, but because that intersection is very dangerous, in all practical sense, you were stopping anyway. Um, the, the DPW is aware of that drainage problem. I'm not sure they're going to be addressing it or how to address it right now, but um, I don't think the stop sign itself is going to make it any less dangerous. In fact, people know the stop is coming now, so they'll prepare for it <coughs> rather than having to stop at the last moment because some car, that was a very dangerous inter intersection, some car is in their way, so they're having to stop. So. Uh, and again, if we have a couple more <laughs> small accidents, we can I, uh, keep alive for a roundabout. Um, the s same question was asked at the Transportation Parking Commission meeting, and in, 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 actually it was implicit. And um, Commissioner Lowenthal uh, s s s turned it around uh, with a rem remarkable perspective and said, if it was that hard to stop coming down the hill, just imagine what it would have been like if you were a pedestrian trying to cross the street. So uh, I think I think that's a it's, I think it's a good point. I think people will have to plan better uh, and drive more carefully. Uh, but that's kind of the point. So any other discussion? Well, call, please. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Freeman. Jr. Aye. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Schwartz. Yes. Councilor Specter. Yes. Councilor Tacey. Yes. Suspend rule 14. Second. Second. Motion to suspend rules and second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I'll accept a motion for the second reading. So moved. Second it. Any further discussion? Mary? Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Specter? Yes. Councilor Tacey? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Next up is also a request for two readings. This is uh, Schedule 1, Parking Prohibition All Times yeah, on South Street. Yeah. Move 5 and 6 as a group. 5 and 6, the motion is for 5 and 6 to be moved as a group. All those in Sorry. favor? Yeah. Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, discussion. Oh, um, do you mind? Go, oh, please. Uh, yeah, no, I'm take it away. I'm not sure we, mo did we move in second? It's been moved in second. Sorry. Moved as a group, right. Uh, the, these two, these two are um, small uh, changes to the code that are meant to accommodate a, um, a, a grandfathered um, veterinary business on South Street. Uh, Councillor Schwartz brought this to um, our attention at the Transportation Parking Commission some months ago, and it took us some time to work out the uh, details of whether ordinance was needed or not, and so on and so forth. But um, well, the solution, the problem is that um, uh, the driveway exit is uh, people are unable to see around sometimes large vehicles. So the solution, which which is a new, new really new for the city, is we've eliminated one space uh, and also created two-hour parking on the remaining two spaces that are in front of the building. Um, it's it's relatively it's we're just trying it to see. If it works for a, a grandfathered business in a residential neighborhood to, um, the, you know, it, to see if, if just a small accommodations can be made for, for visibility. Any other discussion? Questions? Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Barge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Mr. Spector? Yes. Mr. Tacey? Yes. Mr. Adams? Yes. Mr. Curran? Yes. Suspend rule 14. Motion Second. to suspend rules. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> Opposed? Move five and six as a group. Five. Second reading? Is, is there a second? Okay. Can I just speak to the second reading? It's just there really is, uh, we, could, we could wait two weeks, but um, since we've, since it's been, when was it that you came before us? Maybe in the spring? And it's kind of been a while, and we wanted to try to put this in motion. Um, if there's any controversy, we can wait two weeks. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. 
Councillor Lavarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Schwartz? Yes. Councillor Spector? Yes. Councillor Tayson? Yes. Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Number seven here. <clears throat> this is on and off street handicapped parking spaces, so Henshaw seven Avenue. Seven and eight go together as well. Yes. So. Seven and eight, uh, mm -hmm. moving uh -huh. seven and eight together. The Scrivener's error on ordinance passed the City Council February <clears throat> 21st, 2013. And there's a request for two readings on seven and eight. Uh, so the motion's been made. Uh, any discussion on this? I just want to say it, this, this moves a handicapped parking space, if you remember it came in, to right in front of the person's house. It was the, uh, right now the parking space is at the house next door. So because it's yeah. difficult for him to get to the space to, to have. The whole point. Down. It's the whole point. The whole point <laughs> is having to walk down another 30 <laughs> feet. So if we could please put it right in front of the house, that would be, <clears throat> be great. As I recall, an ordinance, they just got the measurement wrong, so it wound up in front of the wrong house. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? Um, Roll call, please. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Tacey? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Motion for suspension of rules? Yes. <coughs> Second. Okay, all those in favor of suspending rules? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Move to approve. Second. Motion is made. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, uh, oh, sorry. Got <laughs> gotcha. Carried away. Carried away. Councilor <laughs> Murphy? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Tacey? Yes. Councilor Adams? <coughs> Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Labar? Yes. All right, we have a number of referrals here. I move refer um, orders 9 through 26 to ordinance. Second. No. No, nope. let's hold off on that. So <coughs> 26 are moved as a group to be referred to ordinance. Move to approve. And the motion's been made. Any discussion Second. on that? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That was. One whole page. Right. Now 27. Mr. President, can I, I have a couple small textual changes to 27. Do you mind if I withdraw it till next meeting? You want to withdraw it? Withdraw it just till next From meeting. From the agenda? Yeah. I have no objection. Are there any objections? Uh, Number 27, the request is to withdraw it from the, from the agenda for in, to show up on the, you anticipate the 21st? Yeah, yeah, I, it's just as written, and it, it's funny to amend it and then refer it. Uh, so it. Just submit. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels, you want me to, yes, to address this now? It's not, not on the agenda, but this is, this would, actually, um, we'll bring this up in new business. Oh, it's What's an information it's request. It's, it's, it's an information request. Okay, you're right. Okay, <laughs> uh, let me do my update first. Actually, I don't have to because Council Labarge took it. It was the just to remind everyone that um, the uh, about the Veterans Day mm -hmm. parade. And for those of you who attend, who can attend, I hope that you'll be able to. And I counsel you to dress warmly and don't forget the breakfast. Uh, this is an information the breakfast. request. The breakfast. The breakfast? Tuesday. There's a, I'll give it to oh yes, yeah. right that breakfast. <clears throat> Thank you. The, this is an information request and. Um, this will uh, require a vote. City Council requests specific information from the mayor pursuant to section 2-7C of the charter. The date of request is November 7th, 2013, today. The following information is requested. The revenue from the EJ Gar uh, Gare Garage, parking garage, downtown parking facility zone 5B between the dates of 1031, 2013 and 11-6, 2013. Uh, the number of vehicles that use the EJ Garrick uh, parking garage zone B between the dates of 1031 and 2013 and 6 2013. The revenue from the EJ Garrick uh, parking garage downtown parking facility zone 5A between the dates of 1031, 2013 and 6 2013. And the number of vehicles that use the EJ Garrick uh, parking garage zone A5. A zone 5A, sorry, between the dates of 1031 2013 and 6 2013. There's that. So. Move to approve the request for information and forward it to the mayor. Second. So motion made and second. Any discussion? Do, does. Um, this is from Council. Does anyone want to ask anything about yeah. that? No? Okay. 
All, okay. all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Any new business? I bet not. Uh, I'll accept a motion to adjourn. Seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you all very much.